29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, declare the meeting open to the public and uh, welcome members to the meeting. Can I just remind members then of the rules around uh, electronic equipment and put your phones on to silent and maybe take them off the top of the benches as well. I'll just wait and see if there are any members of the public coming in. You know how popular DSD committee is? DSD. It's like Margaret Davis. Mary Edgeway. I will continue to say that, I think. Um, everybody's very welcome. And just remember, members, I uh, remind people in the public gallery to switch their phones off, and you can use your tablets through the Wi-Fi system and the Wi-Fi codes available. Okay, we'll move on then to item number one, and that's apologies. Everybody's present, so no apologies. Um, item number two then is chairperson's business. I just have a few things on chairperson's business. Um, can I refer members to page five of your memo? And that's the cancellation of the proposed departmental briefing on the outcome of the consultation of the liquor licence. And um, I know I'm certainly disappointed that, again, this has been cancelled. And I want to ask members, are you content that we write to the Minister um, to outline our disappointment and ask when the briefing on this issue might take place? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Secondly, members also want to bring notice the length of time we've been waiting on responses for some of our queries, um, dating back to January. Although we've received responses from the department over the last couple of days, and I think one as late as last night, some are still outstanding. And I know that the minister most certainly is snowed under um, with documents, um, but I think we need to emphasise that requests from the committee for information should be prioritised, and the agreed deadline is 10 working days, and that needs to be adhered to. Members in agreement? Agreed. Okay. Um, thirdly, then, members, the clerk of the committee for finance has asked that the committee schedule a bu budget briefing before Easter re recess. Are members content that we schedule that briefing for the 2nd of April? Great. And just one more thing. I just want to let members know that I attended the new all-party group on adverse effects in gambling. I just, I'm not a, a, a member of the uh, call. chair, vice chair, Please. anything like that. Yeah. Well, we haven't come up with a definite name on it yet. That's just to, just to inform members that I was at that during the week. Okay? Great. Item number three then is the draft minutes. Can I refer members to page seven of their meeting pack? And can I ask our members content with the draft minutes from the 27th of February 2020 as drafted? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Item number four then is my matters arising. Members have been refrited at page 12 with a response from the Ombudsman in relation to the to committee queries into the Department's administration of PIP. The Ombudsman states that the investigation is going and an update should be published in March 2020. Well, of course, this month the committee will receive a copy of the update. Are members content with that or any comments? No. Content to note? Um, just, Shall I? just to say, Chair, I noticed the other day that there's a review, a consultation on PIP has come out from yes. the Department. Um, but we haven't received notification here. What's the process for the committee receiving notification about consultations? Usually we do receive notification yeah. directly, but I'll, I'll follow up with the department on that. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Um, so are members then otherwise content to note that? Yes? Yeah. Okay, can then um, ask members um, to turn to page 14, where there's a response from a device I and I, or advice I and I, um, to the committee queries on universal credit and implied consent. Are members content to note that also, or any comments? <coughs> no, content to note, okay. Item number five then, members, is correspondence, and can I ask you to turn to the memo at page 17 of your meeting packs? Are members content to action all correspondence as outlined in the correspondence memo? Great. Good stuff, moving on then to item agenda six, which is a briefing by the Deputy Secretary for Engaged Communities, and Kelly, you wanted to yes, turn the test? and and. <laughs> A serious smile. Um, uh, to be transparent, um, I'm related to Maura. Somewhat slightly distanced, it's not very close, but just for transparency, I thought I would declare that interest. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, members, um, the briefing is page 76, and can I invite uh, Maura Dr. Day, Catherine Hill, Maeve Walls, and Sharon Russell to come and take your seats? Thank you. And you're all very welcome. And Maura, are you going to make the opening statement? I am indeed, and if I could just um, say to begin with, I'm struggling a little bit with the cold, so if you see me reaching for the for the water quite a bit, just to just to forgive me. Um, 
wee bit wary of saying that I'm struggling and with the just going to say yes. 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 Can I say yes. back? Can I back just a little? I'm rushing to leave here. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Well, um, we're, we're uh, really grateful, uh, Chair, to be here this morning and, and uh, we're looking forward to, to having the discussion. Um, I'm uh, Moira Doherty, I'm the Deputy Secretary for the Engaged Communities Group within the Department and I'm joined this morning um, by my colleagues Maeve Walls, who is our uh, Director of Culture Division, Catherine Hill, our Director of Active Communities Division and Sharon Russell, the Director of our Voluntary and Community Division. Um, very grateful to have the opportunity to brief members this morning on the work that we do and I hope that our, our presentation and then the discussion that we have will provide you with uh, an understanding of our group and our ALBs and the positive impact that our work has on people's lives. The scope of responsibilities is very diverse so it probably won't be possible for us to cover everything this morning um, but we're very very happy of course to come back on, on any of the, the topics that's required. So we had provided an advanced copy of the presentation and uh, with your agreement Chair I'd just like to take the committee through that and of course we're happy to elaborate on anything as we go. Sure. Sorry, can I just have an interest? I was former Minister at ECA with some of these ALBs. So, okay. thank you. Thank you. So if we're, if we're looking um, at slide two, um, Engaged Communities Group leads the policy agenda in the department on a range of strategic objectives. We aim to enhance cultural and community confidence through sport, indigenous languages, heritage and the arts sectors. We're the lead partner in government for the voluntary and community sector. We drive inclusive growth through our rich and diverse heritage and our work in areas of disadvantage. Turning to slide three, this just sets out the structure of the group. We have six divisions. We have an annual budget of approximately 135.2 million for resource and a further 23.3 million for capital investment. And in terms of staffing, there are around 400 of us who work in the group. Our people have very diverse skills. You have the, the typical skills that you associate with the civil service, you have policy and legislation teams, finance, governance teams. But also uh, we have some specialist skills. We have archaeologists, architects, curators, archivists and conservation crafts people. And uh, we're very proud of that diversity and we think that it's a particular strength of the group. On slide four, um, we set out some of the, the services uh, that benefit the community directly through our arm's length bodies. And you see we have a, a really wide range of uh, arm's length bodies there. And indirectly, we support the provision of funding programmes uh, to a wide range of voluntary community, culture, arts, language, heritage and sporting organisations. And in fact, more than half of our budget is delivered by organisations outside the department. There's significant funding provided to these bodies with a total investment of approximately 74.6 million resource and over 12.5 million in capital. Turning to slide five, I'm, I'm now going to work through each of the areas in turn. So starting with culture division, Maeve's division has a really important policy <coughs> in leading on the development, resourcing and delivery of languages including Irish, Ulster, Scots and Sign Language, the arts and creativity sector, museums and libraries and the ministerial advisory group for architecture and the built environment. It also sponsors a range of bodies as set out there. On languages, the New Decade, New Approach Agreement sets out a commitment to develop strategies on both Irish language and Ulster Scots, and also legislation on sign language to improve access to services for deaf children, adults and their families. The languages team also works with the North-South Body, Forest Nagelega and the Ulster Scots Agency to support and promote our Indigenous languages, heritage and culture. The value of a strong culture and creative sector cannot be overestimated. As the committee will know, Culture and creativity, in its broadest sense, impacts on almost all aspects of society here and shapes our standing as a warm, welcoming place to live, work and visit. And in supporting culture, we are investing in our future cultural, social and economic success. The social impact of culture is widely recognised, inspiring creativity and new connections and promoting health and well-being. And research has demonstrated the value of participation in culture. For example, it can improve a young person's educational prospects and there are positive links between cultural participation, social skills and mental health, for example. Adults who make frequent visits to libraries, arts events or cultural sites also tend to have better health and well-being than those who visit infrequently. And it's worth noting that 87% of people were engaged in arts and culture during 1819. 
the important role that community arts is playing in tackling poverty and isolation and bringing culture and arts to local communities has come into clear focus over recent years and is a key priority. The Department provides around £11 million pounds worth of funding to the Arts Council. The Arts Council is the funding and development agency for the arts here. Support for both arts organisations and individual artists delivers great arts activity to the community and all of the associated social, economic and creative benefits. The division also provides match funding to local councils for community festivals, supporting some 350 festivals each year and attracting more than 1.2 million participants. This represents excellent value for money against an investment of around £370,000 and makes an important contribution to the Executive's commitment to engage more people in arts and culture. Funding support to Northern Ireland's screen provides programmes that maximise the cultural and educational value of our growing screen industry, targeting particularly the most marginalised and disadvantaged schools and communities. For example, the Creative Learning Centres have been supporting schools to innovate with digital technologies and creative learning techniques for over a decade. In 1819, over 2,800 teachers received free training and nearly 12,000 young people from over 500 schools participated in a range of programmes focused on digital creativity. Turning to the work of Libraries NI, the department supports the delivery of the library service across Northern Ireland. Libraries are a central hub of 96 <coughs> libraries across the network and there are almost 300,000 library members. The work of Libraries NI, as I'm sure members will appreciate, goes far beyond books. Programmes aimed at cultural participation, education, child development, active ageing, employment, health and wellbeing. Libraries are vital cultural and social hubs for communities in the heart of communities. And from my own experience, and I'm sure members around this room will also have experience of really benefiting from the activities in libraries and I know myself uh, particularly I look back on uh, the rhythm and rhyme sessions that when I was on maternity leave that were uh, definitely a highlight and provided not only I think you know the, the, the evidence is there for the benefit that they have for the, the children but for me I think there's a huge benefit for uh, parents and carers as well. And thinking about social isolation, we also have an awful lot of other programmes within libraries that are dedicated to improving uh, social inclusion. We have knit and natter groups, tea and newspaper groups, and of those attending the knit and natter groups, 82% said they'd made new friends and 65% identified the library as a safe place to meet people. Turning now to museums, our museums represent a treasure house of the past and we support the work of National Museums which is responsible for four fantastic sites, the Ulster Museum, the Ulster American Folk Park, the Ulster Transport Museum and the Ulster Folk Museum. In 1819 we had over 900,000 visitors of which 310,000 of those were from outside Northern Ireland. This equates to one in seven of every visitor from outside Northern Ireland visiting museums, generating around 18 million of net additional expenditure. In addition to the historical, economic and cultural value of these sites, they also provide a strong educational offering. In 1819, more than 54,000 visitors attended museum sites for formal school engagement activities. National museums also engage in a range of activities to help in enhance social inclusion, such as the Treasure House initiative taken forward in partnership with Clan Mill Housing Association. This aims to address social isolation and loneliness experienced by older people in sheltered housing and housing associations. The Culture Division also supports the iconic Armagh Observatory and Planetarium. AOP is a frontline research facility as well as providing STEM-based education to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. Moving on to slide six, we're now on Catherine's division, Active Communities. Active Communities is leading on the strategic development and delivery of sport and physical recreation, and in partnership with our ILB, Sport NI, is increasing participation opportunities <coughs> for everyone, from grassroots to elite level. The division also has responsibility for delivery of the regional stadia programme and the sub-regional stadia programme for soccer, as well as safety at sports grounds legislation and the provision of related guidance. Physical activity and sport continue to have a transformative effect on communities here, providing opportunities for people to connect and share activities which inspire and motivate. They are also a powerful way of addressing loneliness and building personal and community resilience. 
Working in partnership with the various sports bodies, we will continue to deliver increased opportunities to engage more people to participate in sport and physical activity with a particular emphasis on girls and women, older people, disabled people and others who are underrepresented or excluded. The division also leads on rolling out the Uniting Opportunities Through Sport and Creativity programme, which is one of the headline actions in the TBUC strategy. On slide 7, we turn to the work of the <coughs> Infrastructure Planning and Delivery Support Unit. So I know that committee members will be aware of the positive impact that the redevelopment of Windsor Park and the Kingspan Stadium have had and the benefits that go beyond the pitch. Redevelopment of Casement Park is a commitment in the New Decade New Approach and the Minister is fully committed to doing all that she can to advance to the construction phase at the earliest opportunity. Our Minister has also stated her commitment to delivering the sub-regional stadia programme for <coughs> soccer, which also features in the New Decade New Approach Agreement. And this future investment will help transform soccer at all levels by addressing the current and future needs of the game. The infrastructure for soccer and for sport in general at Stadia and other facilities needs investment to deliver inclusive, welcoming, modern venues that encourage spectator engagement and participation. This will ensure that sport at all levels can continue to develop and thrive. The unit is also responsible for capital investment in cultural, arts and recreational projects to develop community asset and improve access for disabled people. Slide 8 now we turn to Sharon's division and in relation to the voluntary and community sector, her division leads on engagement and partnership working with the sector. <coughs> the division delivers a range of policy and programmes investing around £17 million pounds annually to support the sector in terms of capacity, capability and growth, as well as supporting frontline delivery of critical community-based services, most often to people in need. The department's ongoing support for volunteering benefits individuals, but also delivers wild, wider societal benefit with over a quarter of adults here undertaking voluntary work. Programmes such as the Regional Infrastructure Support Programme, or RISP, provides funding to ensure that at a regional level, the community and voluntary sector has access to support to build and sustain capacity. The Community Support Programme, which is delivered through <coughs> government partners, provides funding for delivery of critical frontline services. The programme has two elements, community development and advice services. Turning to the advice sector, this division provides a range of funding streams to support the independent advice sector and currently annual investment is around £6.2 million. As a result of the welfare reform mitigations, £2 million per year is provided for additional advice provision, £320,000 of which was allocated specifically for appeals last year. This has supported 50 additional jobs in the sector over four years and the Minister has committed to re renewing this provision and decisions are pending on how those allocations will be made. Investment of £1.4 million per annum is currently being made in debt advice services. Funding is provided to Advice NI as the lead provider to manage the multi-channel debt advice service in partnership with 13 frontline advice organisations and NIACRO. This division sponsors three ALBs. The Charity Commission for Northern Ireland, the Commissioner for Older People in Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. The Charity Commission is a regulator and the Commissioner for Older People, Copney and the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Younger People, Nikki, are both corporate souls. Nikki was established through the Commissioner for Children and Young People Act 2003. The principal aim of this office is to safeguard and promote the rights and best interests of children and young people. Copney was established under the Commissioner for Older People Act 2011, its principal aim being to safeguard and promote the interests of older people. The Charity Commission is the statutory regulator for charities. The Commission took on its regulatory powers with the Charities Act Northern Ireland 2013. Since then, the Commission has registered approximately 6,500 charities and made 1,200 casework decisions. As I'm sure most of you will be aware, the Court of Appeal delivered its judgment on the 19th of February dismissing the Commission's appeal against Madam Justice McBride's judgment of June 2019. McBride found that the Commission did not have the power to delegate its functions to staff. The Commission is currently making emergency decisions only through a committee established following the McBride judgment and we will need to consider very carefully our next steps in light of that judgment and I'm sure that the committee will wish to hear from us again when that work develops. The division also leads on social innovation and one of the innovative approaches being taken forward within the team is the social supermarket programme which provides a holistic approach to transitioning people in or at risk of food poverty to a more financially sustainable position. 
Evaluation of the five pilots to date demonstrates that the model has improved members' self-confidence, well-being, healthy eating, financial stability and in some cases employability. The division also leads on community asset transfer, which allows for consideration of transfer of surplus public assets to the community. And there have been a number of successes, including the former police station in Brashean, which is shown in the photograph there, which was acquired by Brashean Community Development Association with the support of Triangle Housing and Mid and East Antrim Council. On slide nine, we turn now to the Historic Environment Division. We are exceptionally fortunate to be the custodians of a vast wealth of historic buildings and sites whose heritage value is greatly admired at home and by visitors. And this includes iconic buildings such as Carrick Fergus Castle, Dunluce Castle, Navan Fort and Derry's Walls. The division led by its director Ian Greenway plays a leading role in policy protection, conservation and promotion of our heritage and in improving an understanding and appreciation of heritage by everyone. The division is responsible for fulfilling a number of statutory duties, including acting as a statutory consultee to planning authorities for approximately 5,000 planning applications per year, issuing archaeological excavation licensing and monitoring the work under those licenses, considering and determining applications for scheduled monument consent, and managing, conserving and enabling public access to 190 state care monuments. The Department will continue to invest in heritage and helping communities to enjoy and realise the value of our historic environment. Our heritage is also a key part of our tourism offering and the Department is delivering a programme of activities to attract more visitors to our heritage sites such as Bally Copeland Windmill and also through Heritage Open Days. Heritage is a vital element of the story of who we are and who we can be, shaping our identity and our communities. The historic environment attracted 10.5 million visitors in 2018. It makes us feel great about ourselves and about this place, with a well-being value of visiting heritage sites of £1,646 per person per year, volunteers in the heritage sector having higher life satisfaction than the general population or other volunteers, and it makes an economic dif difference, with £532 million per year gross value added, sustaining 10,000 full-time equivalent jobs and returning £1.60 extra economic activity over 10 years for each pound invested. On slide 10, we're looking at Community Empowerment Division, which is led by Director David Sales. CED has the lead role in setting policy and operational delivery of programmes to ensure that people living in the most deprived neighbourhoods have access to services and opportunities to make for a better quality of life and improve prospects for them and their families. This includes People in Place, a strategy for neighbourhood renewal, and associated programmes including Small Pockets of Deprivation programme and the Areas at Risk programme. These strategies and associate programmes target 36 neighbourhood renewal areas within the top 10 most deprived urban areas, 15 small pockets of deprivation and 16 areas at risk. The current budget is over £18 million, which supports over 300 revenue projects and just under £4 million of capital support for some 40 capital projects that develop confident communities, support economic activities, improve social conditions through better coordinated services, create safer environments and help create attractive, sustainable environments. An independent evaluation of neighbourhood renewal was conducted in 2014 and that report highlighted a series of key lessons learned and recommendations for consideration for any future policy and practice in relation to tackling spatial deprivation. The department has hosted a series of engagement events with stakeholders to reassess those lessons learned and, rec and recommendations from the evaluation and the feedback of those events correlated strongly with the 2014 evaluation. We are now developing plans for a review of people in place. The review will be based on statistical analysis and community engagement with a view to advising the Minister on future options. The evidence thus far indicates that there remains significant traction in this approach, not least because of the delivery infrastructure that is now well established and we see potential for both sharpening our delivery and improving alignment. <coughs> In conducting the review, the Minister has tasked us with taking a partnership approach in the co-design of future programmes within the context of the anti-poverty strategy. The expertise and experience of neighbourhood renewal partnerships will be instrumental in the review and officials have embarked on a programme of engagement workshops to ensure that this expertise is optimised. The Minister has also indicated recently that the budget for neighbourhood renewal will be protected for the next two years, providing certainty for the sector. On slide 11, we cover PRONI. 
Prony is the official custodian of our historic public record, with state-of-the-art repositories housing over nine centuries of archives and records ranging from 1219 to date. Prony receives, protects and provides access to archives for all, led by its director, Dr Michael Willis. Prony has legislative responsibility for the reception, preservation and provision of access to public records, including records of government departments, courts of law, public bodies, NDPBs and records deposited by businesses and institutions, private individuals and churches. Prony also reaches out to new audiences, both on-site and online, through a range of public access and community outreach programmes. A good example of on-site outreach is the innovative Women in the Archives project, which Prony led and which delivered a range of successful community engagement programmes to over 300 participants in 2019, the majority of whom had never engaged with Prony or Archives in the past. On slide 12, we have uh, some in infographics which you might find interesting, which highlights the engagement in culture, arts and sport, and illustrates the specific engagement figures for arts events, use of the public library service, visits to museums and historic environment. And it illustrates the significant level of participation and engagement by people across the various activities, with some 90% of the population engaged in culture, arts and sports. Slide 13 gives a little snapshot of uh, some of the, the key facts and numbers that mentioned earlier in our presentation. And I think it's helpful for just setting out the scope and scale of what it is that we do, uh, both within the department and through our partners in uh, the sectors that we support. So finally, Chair, in summing up, the work of the group and our ALB partners makes a significant contribution to improving quality of life through enabling more people and communities to actively access and participate in arts, creative industries, indigenous languages, culture and sport, delivering sporting and cultural infrastructure, supporting libraries, museums, culture and historical environment in attracting more visitors and making them more accessible, enhancing efforts to improve health, well-being and physical activity, supporting people, building communities and shaping places. I hope that the committee will agree <coughs> sports, arts, language and culture has a significant impact in terms of promoting equality and inclusion, improving quality of life and contributing to a sense of place and belonging. There is of course more that we can do to promote participation and achievement in sport, recreation, culture and arts and in promoting the benefits of cultural diversity and social inclusion and we're, committing, we're committed to building on our achievements further in opening up new avenues, opportunities and partnerships. We want to work in partnership to promote greater access to our services and in so doing to positively affect health, well-being, community cohesion and make a real difference to people's lives. Chair, I hope that the committee has found this presentation helpful and we're now very happy to take questions on, on any aspect. Mara, thank you very much. That's certainly a massive <laughs> remit that you've oh. covered there. A real mixed bag and um, I'm glad you, good, glad you did come into very first. I mean, I can see just I, uh, your responsibility covers so many aspects of people's lives and promoting it's good brilliant. mental health, you know, promoting tourism, you know, uh, in our, uh, adding to our economy in many ways as well. So, yeah, that was really interesting. I just have a few questions. I have three members down here so far, Carol, Kelly and Sinead. If any members want to um, signal if they want to come in. Um, I want to ask you, just first, you touched on there, you explained about the Charity Commission and the, the result of the judgment yeah. and how it would be uh, emergency decisions only yeah. at the moment. And I do think we will get you back at some stage yeah. in the future. Absolutely. The brief is uh, further on that. Just want to ask, um, given that decision, um, it, it, will that have any effect on any of the other arm's length bodies? Um, that Absolutely. you w would oversee? Well, we, ha we have actually... We have done um, a kind of a, a review, if you like, across to make sure that there aren't any uh, repercussive implications, and that's one of the things, in fact, that we've we've spoken to other departments about, just to make sure that um, if there is a repercussive implication for anyone else, that that is being picked up. And to date, there's there's nothing that has come forward to indicate that that's the case, but we're alive to that. Okay, good. Well, as I say, we'll maybe get you back there. Well, yeah. Not maybe we Absolutely. will yeah. in, in the future to, to discuss that further. Um, can I just then move on to um, the uh, active community slide? Um, it, it said there about um, working with Sports NI um, for uh, 
better uh, participation from those groups that are not naturally participate in many many of the sports, which is great. And it was brought up. I know Kelly brought it up last week as well to look at sports and disability. Um, I just want to ask you on that point. I have been led to believe that Sports NI had cut some of their funding when it came to local councils um, for um, some of the members of the community um, to apply for funding through the councils and through Sport NI. I don't know. I've, I've been led to believe that. I don't know if there's any truth in it. And, and if we are trying to promote of course. Um, more inclusion when it comes to various sports, um, that would be a, a bit of a concern. I don't know if there's, if you can, if you know of that or if it's true or not. No, and um, we can follow that up. But I suppose as we move into the next financial year, we'll be looking at the budgets. So, but we would be looking to to protect the amount that's targeted at those most marginalised. Because I, I know three councils, and I know a lot of us sat on local councils as well. That that's where we would have um, engaged with with people um, that were uh, needing a, a hand up when it came to various sports, and that funding would have been utilised greatly. So it's just a wee bit of a concern that if that has been cut in any way, um, that could lead to issues. I take that away to follow that up. That's but fine. Certainly, it's something we're very focused on. It would be one of our priorities to target those with disabilities, female participation. So we're very focused on that element. And just maybe if you want to expand on a wee bit on some of the work you're doing to try and then increase the participation from some of those I think we would love groups. to happen. <laughs> I think this is, you know, I think this is, I, yeah. I'm sorry to go back to your earlier point, Chair. I think, you know, for all of our on site bodies, it'll be very important that we're communicating clearly with them, the Minister's priorities and making sure that um, the, the, the spend is very much reflective of where the Minister's priorities are. And certainly to date, her very clear indication is that inclusion and participation is very important. So um, it'll it'll be it'll be down to us to make sure that that's reflected very clearly. Um, the, the the work the work that the team has done is particularly on participation and inclusion is something that uh, we're very proud of. And indeed, we had visitors from the Scottish government actually over um, a week or so ago to learn from the team. Um, and you know they they are an absolute credit in terms of uh, the passion and commitment that the show and maybe Catherine you could I mean we, we would see an overall turn on the curve in terms of sports participation including those marginalized groups but what we still see is a gap so we're still not seeing those with disabilities reaching the elements of everybody else so we remain very focused on that so we have worked extensively with the sector and um, we have our active living no limits um, policy which is targeting those with disabilities. So we developed that in association with Sport NI, Disability Sport, Special Olympics and Governing Bodies. And there's been quite a substantial investment. So you'll all be familiar with the hubs in the local councils. So there was about a million invested in those. We've also got the pool pods, again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with from your local swimming pools. Um, I don't know if any of you have been to Gosford to the all-out trekking which is outdoor trekking facilities for those with disabilities. And we had the opportunity to, to go down, and it's fantastic. Um, we also work closely with Special Olympics. So we've got the Winter Games coming up at the end of this month. So that was launched quite recently. And we continue to provide funding through Everybody Active. So there's a lot of work going on in the sector at the minute. And if I could add to that, Chair, just to say, as, as we go through, there's a, a lot of things that we're talking about that you know you might consider as a committee that you would like to go out and mm -hmm. see. Yep. And I think Go you know Gosford in particular, I think would be you know I, I think you would really um, get a lot from it, and I think it would be great. Some of the things that we do, I think it would be great for you to see it firsthand. Mm -hmm. So certainly, as, as we go through, there will be quite a lot of things that come up that might give you food for thought if you were. Um, Venturing. I know certainly as, as I was reading your um, the, your PowerPoint that you'd sent us and listening to you, I was thinking, yes, I would like to go there and I'd like to go there. So, yeah, and I know as a committee we, we do want to get out as much as possible over the, the rest of the mandate, so yeah. And I think it That'll really be. helps whenever you hear firsthand, certainly for me, I know it made a difference when I got to meet the people yeah. involved and to see the difference it made to lives. So. Thank you. I just want to ask you one more thing before I bring members in, and that's to do with um, the arts. And um, we know that you know in Northern Ireland we put less money into arts per head of population than any other region. Um, and it's just you know how do we address that when it comes to the programme for government outcomes? And I suppose what what work is being done cross departmentally as well when it comes to the arts. You know I do believe that it is a great way when it comes to improving people's mental health and various other issues, you know, and I don't want to see it dropping any further down on any, you know, on any of our, our funding streams as well. So, just 
just really to ask you. Well, I think, Chair, we're that. delighted to hear that because obviously um, we're hugely passionate advocates for the arts in terms of all of the uh, tremendous benefits, and I think in particular, you know, we were such a creative place, and the the artists that we produce are of such high quality, and we. We're very proud of the opportunity, not only to showcase those, but also to, to grow and develop more talent. Um, I think you make a really good point about how we're working across departments, and I think that that's something that um, particularly will be on, on us, uh, to, to play a leadership role there in terms of working with colleagues across departments, and certainly if the committee can... Uh, can lend any, any weight or lever to that. I think that's really important, not only in terms of demonstrating, and I, and I think this is this is where we, we need to be more vocal about the, the hard evidence that we have around the benefits that arts brings, not only for um, health and wellbeing, but also for the economy. Uh, and, and I think that'll, that'll be important for us to be able to make that case. Um, in terms of the, the spend, per head of population, of course we would say um, we would always welcome more funding for the arts, you know, and uh, when you have a, a limited budget and so, so many competing priorities, of course that's difficult. Um, I suppose, and I'll, 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 I'll hand to, over to Maeve now, it depends how you look at it. So um, in terms of some of the statistics that we have, actually it looks as if the investment here um, is not perhaps as, as stark as it appears. To, it, depend, it depends how, it's, how it is measured. So, for example, if you look at England and Wales, the, the way that it's measured there, they also include investment in museums and libraries, which isn't how we calculate it. And perhaps, Maeve, do you want to yeah, follow so, up on that? So, so the official standardised figures on this would say that gap is not so great okay. when libraries and museums and other cultural activity is factored into it. But there is no doubt at all that arts organisations and the arts sector you know, is, is vocal and has been experiencing certainly you know, the, the sharp end of funding difficulty. So as Moira says, um, we, we think it really important and great work has been done there to, to amplify the benefits of what they're doing so that people understand that whilst art for art's sake is important, there are lots and lots of other spin-offs to that. I think on a very practical level, what we've been doing also is if additional money becomes available in year, um, we, we have a list. Um, you, you know, we have hungry hands and a list of uh, important work that can soak that up. And we're working with the sector on that basis that if and when opportunities arise, um, we take them. We're working with the sector also actively in looking at some issues about sustainability. And we're considering very closely at the moment a project on, on sustainability for the arts sector that might help them to look at the business models of how they operate. No, thank you. I mean, I, I know from a constituency level, we have the Newton Abbey Arts and Cultural, Cultural Network up in Rathkill. We do great work, cross community work as well, and, and you know, and are, are thriving and are growing from strength to strength. So I, I see the difference that has made in many young people's lives. My other question, just on that as well, is if just any um, any chapters been with yourselves in Department of Economy when it comes to jobs within the arts as well. They're not something that um, we, we see promoted often, and yet there are many careers and many jobs within the... So maybe a wee bit more working on that would be good as well. And, and on that point, many in the sector um, will we'll talk about what a precarious um, uh, living it can be. Um, having said that, some of the work that we're supporting through Northern Ireland Screen that's looking at the pipeline for creativity generally, because those creative skills <coughs> are just in the industry itself, um, in the film industry, but for problem solving and for creativity on a much, much wider platform in the economy also. So the point's well made. And, and just picking up on that, um, and again, sorry, as I'm now giving you, you know, a big list of places you can go and things that you can see. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that we fund for Northern Ireland Screen, I was I was out a couple of weeks ago, um, young people that they brought in to give a taster of hair and makeup for stage and screen. And um, they it it's then that conversation led into all so because we have this thriving sector here now and certainly I got a, a note through the door the other night they were filming 
line of duty round the corner from my house. The fact that this is now such a thriving sector, up until now, people had to be imported to do all of the ancillary work. Mm -hmm. And it was starting to describe for me that they need lawyers, they need accountants, they need catering staff. You know, it was a whole range of things that perhaps I hadn't thought of when I thought of the people needed to support uh, the creative sector here. And, and I absolutely agree with you that um, that connection with the Department for Economy is something that, that we, we should be lifting and, and maximising, so we'll absolutely take that away. Stop. Okay, thank you. I'm going to open up to members. Um, Carol? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, in the new decade, new approach document, I know it's probably not primarily with yourself specifically, but certainly sign language is mentioned by yourself. Um, we just, first of all, I'd like to know where that's at in terms of the legislation coming forward, because we had the legislative programme come from the executive, um, and we need to see that sign language bill progress as quickly as possible, because there's lots of work been done on it from nearly a decade ago, and it seems just to be sitting there. Um, so you've that. You've partly mentioned or answered the question in relation to neighbourhood renewal and the connections with and the links with community empowerment. And you did say that there was an evaluation. So it would be really good to see how that links into the anti poverty strategy. Um, because I, I know myself probably as a former neighbourhood renewal worker years ago. Um, but some of the targets that were set at the very start have just been kind of sitting there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we aren't the same as Bradford. No. And um, certainly there's been not only political changes, but there's also economic changes. So a lot of those areas that are in neighbourhood and rural areas are actually, unfortunately, still within the top 10% of most deprived. So we'd like to see how, and then the areas at risk as well, so we'd like to see how what work's been taken forward to link it in with an anti-poverty strategy and certainly with the programme for government. And then the last question I have, and it might be for another team, but certainly um, when you mentioned the kind of funding around the independent advice sector, which is really important, um, but I'd like to find out what money has been set aside for um, Grassroots groups, God bless you, grassroots groups within the community that are linked to the independent advice sector but still provide that cold face that aren't included. So, you know, what opportunities will they have, and particularly around tribunals, because you mentioned it as well, you know, 60, I think it was 60% of tribunals in PIP were overturned, mm -hmm. and the misery that families and particularly applicants have had to endure waiting on that process happening. Um, there's something wrong there. But actually getting tribunal support has been very difficult. And it's OK if you live in Belfast, but if you live in Derry or Straban or elsewhere, you know, so uh, are there plans to have those services funded and supported right across? Because the number of applicants are coming right across and have had to wait um, a long time. Um, so I would just... If you could respond to those, and if not, happy to get the information when you yous get it. OK, well, I'll pick up on the, the sign language point first. And A um, couple, couple of weeks ago, I was with one of our, our colleagues from Maeve's team at a, a sign language event at Queen's, and, um, and we were speaking about the the appetite within the, the deaf and, and hard of hearing community for this legislation. I mean, it, is, um, it has been a major milestone, I think, for the community to see that in the, in the deal. And uh, certainly that legislation will be hugely significant. But at the same time, they were acknowledging um, the great work that has, has gone on. And our, our colleague who, who leads on that, Tommy McCauley, who um, mm -hmm. Just um, as a legend, as mm -hmm. far as far as the the work goes, he's he's absolutely um, he's an absolute powerhouse and has been. While that, as you say rightly, that legislation for for obvious reasons hasn't progressed, 
he has been um, working away on a number of programs that have delivered real um, tangible benefits for, for many families in the, the deaf and hard of hearing community. Um, the legislation now will be a priority and having um, a bill team to take that forward and perhaps maybe you, you might want to add to that. I mean, just to underline that, the, the commitment and passion in that very small team is evident mm -hmm. and they can't wait to get at it. I mean, the work that was done previously is not lost. There's a body of work that's there uh, and they're working now to get that moved quickly and, and, uh, and to agree a timescale with the Minister. S sorry, could I just expand on that? So, say for example, the, the framework's been done, Minister Given brought a draft bill forward. So, and there's been constant communication with the community, the deaf and hard of hearing yeah. community. I mean, T Tommy's work is well recognised, um, more so by families, to be fair, you know. So, so we're lucky that we'll have that work done. It's just that I think there's a bit of disappointment um, that I've picked up even just yesterday that in the announcement for legislation pro or legislative programmes, that knowing that the work that was done, I think they expected to see a bill come before before the summer. I mean, it, it would be remiss of me to put a, a time scale on this now without um, a discussion with the minister. Well, no, I'm not. Timescale. I'm not suggesting that. But, yeah. You know, but but certainly the point about the need for pace is well understood, and and like I say, you know, a great body of work done there already. Okay. Thank you. Um, your, your second point around uh, neighbourhood renewal, the um, Minister has been really clear with us that uh, neighbourhood renewal and how we take that forward will be a really important pillar of an anti-poverty strategy. And she, I mean, just, just yesterday the, um, the Director David Sales was having a meeting with Beverly Walls who is leading on uh, the anti-poverty strategy just to make sure that um, the two things dock in together. Um, I also think it's really interesting what you say about programme for government because um, we see from the evaluation that Neighbourhood Renewal has delivered a huge amount of good. Um, there's probably some untapped potential there and I think if we were um, you know, if we were speaking to, to people on the ground and speaking to the team uh, that works on this uh, within our group, they would say that perhaps the, the joined up working that was envisaged at the beginning perhaps uh, perhaps didn't reach the level of maturity that it might have done. So I think we have a huge potential now with a focus on an outcomes-based programme for government, a focus on collaboration. I think we have an opportunity to reboot that and to see is there a different way of uh, bringing resources to bear in a locality and having, having more joined up discussions around the table that make sure then that the resources that are coming in from the different statutory agencies, their impact is actually amplified because they've been targeted in the right way. Can I just say, Maura, that the joined up work wasn't a problem for the community? They wanted this. Yes. No, no, it was the statutory bodies who didn't always join up as best possible, and then the community <coughs> were getting blamed. The fact that we're now hearing, and I've heard since, that, and it's right to say we, we could have had better outcomes if we all had to work together. I think we need to be clear who who we all are, because yeah. the community are left feeling they've been carrying the can with very little money for years, looking for their statutory partners to help them deliver, and the statutory partners have delivered, but not always in a very effective or more productive way. So if we can just make that, def I just want to make that definition. Yeah, well, I think that, that point was coming out very clearly in the evaluation, that that's how, that's how people felt, was that they, uh, the statutory sector hadn't been as joined up as it should have been um, and I think that that point's understood and it's something where um, we're going to need to to work across government to make sure that um, we are better aligned and I think we have a great opportunity with an anti-poverty strategy and with um, an outcomes based program for yeah. government just to reboot our approach around that and then finally on your your, your point about um, independent advice you know, that's uh, Clearly, very important for the minister. She's, you know, from from very early days, she had been very, very clear about the importance of access to independent advice. And maybe on the specific points, Sharon, do you want to okay. lift those? Okay. Um, obviously, you'll be aware that 
prior to the welfare reform mitigation, you know, the Everson report and the Everson funding, there is like regional infrastructure support for advice. It's been there for many years. It's sitting at the minute about 1.1 million. It goes out through Advice NI. It used to go out through Advice NI and Citizens Advice before mm -hmm. Citizens Advice closed. Then we would put out about 1.8 million a year through local government for frontline delivery. Councils match that. They're currently putting in more than us, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, over 2 million. Um, and that was funding what we would call generic advice, business as usual, until obviously welfare changes or welfare reform came along and Eileen and Kevin um, did their report. And that recommended £2 million additional for four years for advice. Now that £2 million broke down into about a million and a half for a Northern Ireland wide helpline, uh, which has been very effective, um, and for face to face support, which went out again through a consortium, CAB, when they were there, and Advice NI. There was another half a million that was around capacity, building and support that in recent years, and I know um, other members here at committee were interested in that as well, in recent years, due to this sector reporting very high volumes of appeals, including representation and second tier, you know, where you would need the law mm -hmm. centre, yeah. um, the department did put out additional money from that half a million. Last year it was about 320,000 distributed across all advice organisations. There are there is a centralised model in Belfast, Belfast Citywide Tribunal Service, and there is what Derry is calling the Derry model. You'll not be surprised. Um, and they have centralised um, appeals as well, because of the expertise and specialism you might need mm. and all of that. Um, we have, and I know committee was interested in this at your last meeting, I think, um, in advance of uh, the restoration of the Executive and the Assembly, we commissioned the Strategic Investment Board to undertake, not really, um, I know that the committee maybe thought it was a review of advice. What we were looking for was the evidence to present to a new, a, an incoming minister, or if you hadn't come back to our permanent secretary, to help make the decision around, you know, the other mitigations you're considering, uh, you know, um, or the minister has committed to running them on. We wanted to have the evidence for the additional advice. That's 50 additional jobs, including appeals. That report... That the, the review has reported, the report's with the Minister at the minute, and it's very clear from the report that there is a continued need for additional advice uh, investment, including <coughs> appeals, um, and we have obviously advice with the Minister on the back of that report um, about what, how she might want to distribute, allocate and break down the two million a year if she's continuing that on, if you know what I mean. So appeals is a big part of that advice to her, but you know that, that's with her at the minute to, to decide how she wants to break it down. But I, but I can say that appeals is very much in that advice that she's she's working through at the moment. Can I just add, add a supplementary on that to do with how we work out where we place our advice services within the entire um, country? Mm -hmm. um, and I know there will be many historic where CAB was always based yes. in certain towns mm -hmm. and villages around around Northern Ireland. Um, and it's just looking at that. When was the last time that sort of scoping exercise was done, looking at where yeah. we actually base our, our advice, yeah. given that there yeah. may be extra money coming into it, yeah. and maybe having to look at, at various yeah. areas that are not... And so it's an interesting same. question, because there's two different models. So, so for the, what I described earlier, before welfare reform, that sort of generic uh, model of, of advice, we work through local government, which, you know, if you think about the context of community planning, you would assume mm. best place to decide in terms of local <laughs> need. So we transfer that money across to local government um, on the basis of a formula that's actually linked to the deprivation measures, non Ireland deprivation measures. That's how we allocate them to local government. They then decide. And I know it's, it's something that maybe needs clarified because we do get a lot of questions about it. Count, the council decides where to put it on the basis of need. Some of them have um, long-standing commissioning models. Some of them procure. But we don't decide where it goes. But we do decide now what allocation each council gets. On the welfare reform specific piece, what we did four years ago, not me, others, um, but um, four years ago, we took advice from um, the analysts in the department. And given that welfare changes and welfare reform, nobody knew what, how it would pan out. You know that obviously we thought by this stage universal credit would be across Northern Ireland and all of that. So what was decided then was the single biggest change was probably DLA to PIP. 
So the model for allocating that funding was worked out on the take-up recipients of, of PIP across Northern Ireland because they, it was seen as that would be the biggest need, you know. Um, so that's just how it was worked out at that stage. And at the minute, obviously, ELA to PIP for new claims and for you know migration has all happened. So again, we have told the minister we will then be looking at you know how we would and we would do that with the advice sector, which we always would. You know, we have at a strategic partnership level, advice NI is now the only just to be the two organisations. So we would, they're closest to delivery, be talking to them about the best model that we would use then to break that down. Okay, that's grand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, get you finished, Carol? Yes, yes thank you. Right. Okay, Kelly. Um, I have a few questions um, with your patience, but the first one I'll actually come back to you on that appeal is we're a committee that needs to scrutinise the work of the department. And what you're talking about is money into the advice sector to deal with appeals. And I absolutely agree, the appeals sector, to be honest, I get a lot of people into my office looking for me to take them to appeals and I point them in the direction of the experts who should be helping them. But can I just say as a scrutiny committee? Should we not be investing in why the appeals are happening in the first place? Because the amount, as Carol has already indicated, 60% are being overturned at appeals. That means there's a fundamental problem with the assessment system. And we're throwing good money after bad if all we're doing is putting a stick and plaster over what somebody else's mistake has created. So I would ask then, within the department, not just with programme for government, we're looking for cross-departmental working, but intra-departmental working. And some of my questions are going to are linking into that. Um, to be honest, this money, the need for the investment is being created by the Department for Communities. Um, so I would ask if there is some consideration there about how we're actually going to stop the appeals being required in the first place by getting the things right first. Um, and, and our evidence does show that it's not right first time. And the pain that that causes to people <coughs> is causing the mental health problems in Northern Ireland, or some of the mental health problems in Northern Ireland. So just um, start off with that one first. If you don't mind, then I'll come, because it's a slightly separate. I, I probably will disappoint you in terms of, only because it's not under more yeah, agreement. Yeah. So so the benefit side in terms of, and I know Colin Boyle and Jackie were here. Yeah. Um, and I, I, you know, far be it from me to answer on, on, on their behalf, but, but I know from just published data, um, you know, in conversations within the department that obviously we're talking about the number of, of cases that go to appeal and then the number of those that are successful, you know, yeah. might be 65, whatever percent or higher, but the number who go, that goes to appeal has to be taken into the round. It's small. I don't know if there's been comparisons with other jurisdictions, but I know that certainly um, the advice sector um, has amplified that yeah. whole issue and that, you know, You'll, you've probably had Colm and Jackie here and maybe Mickey Kelly and others talking about PIP and maybe you'll have a specific session on it. It's something that, as Maura has said earlier, very, very alive to. Um, and, um, you know, and I think in the, in the round, they would contend that it, it is high within the number of um, appeals taken, but the number of appeals taken small. The, the other thing that they would say is there's always new evidence introduced and obviously they can't make a decision um, if there's an absence of evidence. And when the new evidence is presented, then obviously that has a different outcome. But, you know, um, I think that's something they, they would be welcome, you know, welcome I think opportunity that, to I think my concern would be that, you about. that this second um, consultation on PIP is coming out. And I would very much like yeah. that the investment that's having to be pumped into the advice sector is taken into consideration as part of the, the departmental's consideration or department's consideration on that. Because... We are just putting stick and plasters over a problem here instead of getting that solved. And it's for communities. I know it's not course, necessarily under yourself course. to look after that. Yeah, we'll um, that thank you very much. Now, I'm actually going to keep with the community and voluntary sector, Sharon, if you don't mind. I'm not picking on you, but I'll get to others. Um, I was just wondering, I worked in the community and voluntary sector, so it's a, a comp maybe I should be declaring that for 16 years prior to coming to this job. Um, can I just ask, is there any plans to update the Concordat Agreement with the community and voluntary sector? And the reason why I ask that is because there are more and more departments compelling volunteers to deliver work that they're not allowed to compel them to do mm. to replace paid workers. Yeah. It's so, 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 so timely. Know, so exactly. It's so timely. You yeah. saw us smiling at each other as you were asking the question. Actually, we're going straight from here. We're Great. going straight from yes. here to um, a meeting of the Joint Forum. You're aware of the Concordat. Obviously, you've, you, you've asked the question about it. And, you know, it's, it like underpins the relationship between government, all of government, yeah. and the sector. 
Um, there's been a bit of work um, in the sector, so the Joint Forum brings us together. This is the vehicle through which we meet um, and discuss at a strategic level um, the, how we can empower and enable the sector to um, obviously deliver outcomes, influencing government policy and obviously delivering on the ground. It would be fair to say there is a frustration in the sector that we um, maybe share now in terms of that relationship being maybe suboptimal mm -hmm. and some of the conditions that we exist to create um, aren't you know, um, optimal either in terms of enabling and empowering the sector. So yes is the answer to your question. We are engaged in uh, a dialogue at the minute that we think um, will produce a result in terms of a co-produced piece of work over three years um, and I, I mean meaningful co-production and it can only be meaningful if we resource the work in the sector same way as internally. Um, we're, we're putting these proposals to the sector this afternoon Very good. Um, um, that will bring forward um, potentially maybe you know um, a strategic document a strategy or a policy framework we don't want to dictate what it is we want to do that together. So we haven't even drawn a frame around what this piece of work will look like. We just know we're going to commit to it in the long term, at least three years. It doesn't, you know, um, put in the investment of time, effort, and resource um, to really reset that relationship and reset, if you like, like and enable those conditions. I always think if you, if the economy department exists to um, create the conditions whereby the economy flourishes and there's inclusive growth. We in communities exist to make sure that the community and voluntary sector has the, the conditions whereby it can be an equal pillar to the public sector and the private sector to deliver our programme for government. And um, that's where they want to be, and, and they're not there that, at the minute. Just on that, um, oh, it's, it's years ago I attended a conference in, in Antrim actually, where the Welsh Assembly Government discussed about moving from grants to contracts. Um, and in moving to grants to contract, when they did the review, 4% of the contracts out of government were being delivered by social economy mm -hmm. enterprises. Yes. Um, because they took a way to include, and I know Sue Gray, the mm -hmm. Department of Finance, is looking at this for um, social value, not yep. act, but social value clauses, um, that there was a better way to fund yep. that meant then that people, for instance, the department could dictate terms that they wanted delivered upon, which reaches our programme for government objectives, yep. but it also gives those organisations, instead of having to depend on grants that could be pulled at any time, they would be um, have a, a contract yeah. with set terms and conditions that the department couldn't break. So there's a bit of uh, consideration on that. I'm just wondering if that's part of the mix if and if whether we think about the social economy enterprise model will be pushed the same as Wales, because it went from 4 to 34 per cent in a matter of four years. It's all fours, but um, it, it's well worth it because the social return on investment is just amazing. Yeah. It, it very much is part of our discussions at the minute. And more mentioned earlier, the Minister is totally committed uh, to looking at new models for funding. I mean, um, there is our commissioning approach, there is, you know, there's grant, there, there, uh, the public health agency and others use procurement. Yeah. I, I was surprised, you know, in some of our dialogue at the minute that there is a, an appetite uh, for, for procurement in the sector, or some parts of it, yeah. usually the bigger um, organisations. But all of that, in terms of those conditions I described, all of those are part of that sort of enabling infrastructure. Um, Lots of different views uh, in the sector, and, and yeah, Minister is totally committed to community wealth building, um, community assets, and unleashing the power of those community assets. And um, you mentioned maybe not going so far as the Social Value Act. That's very much on the agenda at the minute, actually. Okay. Social Value Act is being discussed, DOF, and um, yeah. Uh -huh. okay, so if I could mm -hmm. just just add, I, I want to just go back, mm -hmm. Kelly, just mm -hmm. um, if I may. Um, the, the point that you raise, we will of course take away mm -hmm. about the fact that you know we're investing in advice for mm -hmm. issues that are in other parts of the department. Mm -hmm. you know, while it might not be within my remit, we are of course one department and we're one mm -hmm. team, yeah. and it is very important that um, that, mm -hmm. that we um, that we work in that way and that you know that we work in that way. So of course we we will take that away. Um, just again to echo what mm -hmm. Sharon was saying about the. Um, the work with the with the voluntary and community sector, um, we we've been given a very clear stare from the minister that she wants that relationship to be reset, and um, no, we had we had been having discussions anyway, um, particularly around you know you, you raised the, the point there about funding, 
um, terms and conditions for people funded in the voluntary and community sector, also the impact of um, annual budgets, the lack of certainty, the lack of sustainability, and that speaks, in fact, to your point earlier, Chair, about, um, you know, because often uh, jobs within the arts sector, there's a, a great number of those are voluntary and community sector jobs, and, and I think the, when, when Sharon talks about um, a kind of a three-year horizon, that's for the very strategic piece of work. The Minister's been very, very clear with us that she wants to see action quickly on some of yeah. these other things, particularly the things that are um, making it difficult for people to be strategic because of the conditions that are created by uh, the public sector in terms of that, that one that one year horizon for funding. Okay, thank you very much. I just had two more short short ones. Um, they're sort of linked. Um, I know that in the future, hopefully, we'll get an update from the Charity Commission on or what's happening with the Charity Commission. There are a number of organisations that cannot get registered, um, and and it means that they're losing out on opportunities for funding. But it was just on money. The H Historic Environment Division love it absolutely, love it to bits. But I'm very, very concerned that that division has been saying during the impasse when we weren't here that they didn't have enough money to take legal action against some of the private people, the private owners of historic buildings or places um, for upkeep. And I draw attention, for instance, Kirkcoven Harbour is just one example where it's fallen apart. Um, heaven forbid that the Duke of Edinburgh something terrible you know could happen he may not be with us much longer that that harbour has a piece on it where he landed here and i can't remember what date in the 1950s and to be honest it's going to fall into the sea shortly just with the number of of course coastal erosions affecting that but i'm just worried that the historical environment division is being seen as the poor relative and doesn't have enough money to invest um i see kirkson castle locally the volunteers the work that they do there to keep that open is amazing and that's enabled by the historic environment division but are we in danger of losing our beautiful buildings and, and places because we can't invest there? Well, I think I would love to get um, Ian, Ian Greenway and colleagues from the division here. I think they would they would be delighted to give you a presentation. And of course, as with our arts sector and our uh, voluntary mm -hmm. community sector, of course we would love to see more investment in heritage. And you know, there's. Um, there's absolutely no doubt that um, more more money could be put to good use. For the money that we, we do have, I think the prioritisation is really important because, of course, there's always going to be limited um, always going to be limited resources. And I think where Ian has been particularly <coughs> strong, along with his colleagues in the team, is thinking about well, how can we work with others? And he's certainly been doing a lot of work with that heritage sector more broadly because there is obviously a broader sector there outside of the department. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's the kind of space that we're, we're trying to get into more generally, which is how can we be creative about the partnerships that we can have? And I think particularly, um, you know, if we think about um, the, you know, the city deals and, and, and all of that, where, where can we use use the other resources that are available to us to, to leverage in the funding for these really, really important assets. And again, you know, there are a great many, perhaps perhaps slightly more suitable for a visit than Kirkcobbin Harbour. You know, maybe <laughs> what uh, so, some of the amazing um, state care monuments that we have in Carrick Fergus Castle, the one million pound, absolutely fabulous Irish oak roof. That was, um, you know, last week we were so proud to see that, um, and that's the thing about our, you know, and certainly our colleagues that um, architects and archaeologists and conservationists who would come and talk to you so knowledgeably about the value of these assets, and, and once they're gone, that you can't get them back, and that those assets are what is that heritage which is so unique to us. And um, and certainly brings you know so much pleasure and economic benefit of course, um, but certainly that point's very well made and, and certainly we we very much understand the importance of the investment in I think, heritage um, assets. Just just Kirkcabin Harbour, it is a beautiful part of the world. Of course, it's my constituency. Um, but one of the things about it is the lack of forcing that private owner to keep their uptake means that infrastructure will probably have to rebuild that that um, shoreline wall. Um, and the road is is being undermined. So there's there's a cross departmental issue to this one as well, um, where we do have some of the infrastructure is going to have to pay. And I'm not talking to be small. It's going to be run into probably closer to a million pounds to replace that part of the road if that 
facilities allowed to erode much further back. Um, so there's there's joint departmental considerations. So I appreciate that we don't um, have enough money to do everything. But it's when you see if we don't do that, the cost will be. Um, and there's lots of stuff um, there that I could continue, but I'm not going to take up any more of the committee's time. But thank you very much. And um, can I just say close to International Women's Day? It is lovely to say women's leaders women. here today. From the I know Johnny <laughs> wants to ask a supplement. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's, on, yeah, just on that. And again, I echo Kelly's comments in relation to the Historic Environments Division, uh, and particularly the projects that you've mentioned. I've visited yeah. many of them, and, and it's a fantastic job. Um, my question is more in relation to the, in the fund streams that come from that historical d division in relation to particularly um, those uh, listed buildings that are in our community that are quite uh, often handed down throughout through generations um, with the listed nature there's an inability for them to draw down the huge costs that are needed to preserve whether it's windows doors etc the exteriors I, I fear for the loss of these uh, wonderful buildings in our countryside and communities right across the country and I know that the current funding streams that are in place quite often require match funding uh, there there's an inability because of the huge cost with running these buildings to, to to raise that match money and I would ask you please to take away and, and consider different ways in which we can um, get across funding to those listed buildings that aren't in your car but in gain in custodians of, of many people across our constituency so it's just a point to note yeah and I think you know, I I think that's it goes to the, the broader role of, of the division and I always have to remind myself because um, the, the, the state care monuments because um, well it's not many jobs that you get to say you have castles yeah. you know it's you know, me and a few Disney princesses maybe but you know it's uh, you know it is it is wonderful but there, there is there's so much more to the work of that team and I think that broader focus on heritage generally, is, is really important and particularly where it interfaces with uh, private interests yes. uh, whether that is um, in, a, in a positive way in terms of supporting people for the upkeep of um, their own heritage assets and listed buildings or indeed where uh, that's perhaps not the case but I, I, I take your point and, and certainly very happy um, to have the team back to have a, a deep dive on that one I think, and I th really I th welcome th it. think sure, just to finish that in, in relation to I know many of our churches as well uh, face this similar problem. Huge costs for the replacements of uh, in particular windows uh, and, and they want to see the integrity and the design kept of their building but the huge costs mean that quite often some people are forced down a road that they don't want to go and we, no we normally see these buildings and schools etc forced into disrepair and we, we lose these assets so uh, I just wanted to put it on record. Thank you. Sure, we, we didn't answer part of your question. Could I just pick yeah, it up because it's important? Why it's important, um, Vice Chair, is you know you mentioned that some charities are having difficulty getting registered and I just would yes. want to assure you, I think it's important for those charities to know that obviously as a result of the, the judgment, the McBride judgment, um, there will be a backlog of, of registrations because they're being made by an emergency committee, all decisions. However, it's really important to note that a charity should not suffer any detriment because of that. They can still apply for tax exempt exemption with HMRC. And importantly, if they were applying for a grant or something and had to say they were a charity, the Charity Commission will give them something to say all of that. So that, I think that's an important point to get out at this stage. OK, and sorry, I have another short supplementary on the previous <laughs> point before I bring Sinead in. And Robin, you wanted to ask? Yeah, sure. I, I was with... Uh, I was in probably one of Northern Ireland's most historic buildings yesterday, just a mile from here, and uh, fully operational as a school. The building has a significant history in the history of Northern Ireland, played a major part. They tell me now that they are no longer eligible because they are a school to actually uh, be eligible for a historic environment uh, grant. Uh, would that be right? And if so, why would that be right? I and, think and I, would, you, I would need to see the if, data. I was going to say, if you want, if you, well, it's, it's, if you Campbell, Campbell, it's Campbell College. Uh, if you could provide us with the detail, and we'll we'll write back to you very happily. Well, the detail is that they would like some money from you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 
politician. That's the key. That tends to be. That tends to be the key. Well, let me put it to. Well, let me put it to this way: if I if I give your name to the principal, you'll be content with that. No problem. Okay, I'll come back to some other questions. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. No pressure there either. Even your name might not. No, again, thanks for the presentation. I have a few issues I want to raise, so I'll I'll just rattle through them and you can come to them when you. Uh, whenever you can. So it's just to concur with what uh, Paula, with the chair, said in terms of the arts. Um, you know, I w- would firmly be a big supporter of the arts, but you know, I think we need to maybe have a wee look about, uh, about you know the type of art that we're funding and maybe what our priorities are. Because I'd very much be of the opinion that we, you know, art needs to belong to the community. It needs to be brought into the community and not be something that's sitting outside a lovely shiny building somewhere that you, you go to look at. You know, once once every so often, um, and I think we have to change how we think about the arts too. That it's not just an, something that's extracurricular, um, because you know I attended a, a an event um, uh, by Annie Screen last year, and again the, the sentiment was, you know, we want to be thought of as this is a, a viable um, career that people can have. Uh, and of course, one of the themes at that event as well was the huge impact that Brexit's going to have uh, on the arts and our cultural scene in terms of touring companies and, and people being able to travel abroad and, uh, and come here to work as well. So I think we need to really start to take that seriously and, and think about that um, long term as well. Uh, you know, when we're talking about um, culture and, um, and music and things like that, we know that music and the arts are being, you know, they're being stripped away, they're being, you know, they're being um, stripped back from the, the school's curriculum. And there's a number of very um, important cultural bodies out there that are filling that gap. Um, Kyltus, just to, to name one. Uh, and I think we need to really think about how we're funding those, those types of um, organisations because they do play a vital role. Uh, I think we need to support them more. Um, I think, again, picking on something that, that, that the Chair had said, I think we're the only region, um, the only place across these islands that doesn't have a physical activities strategy. Um, and that's obviously for people who are not, um, don't play maybe a team sport or aren't or associated with a particular club. Um, and it's about getting those people active and, and getting those people into, into physical activity and into, into some sort of, you know, sport. Um, so that's something that I would like to see the, the Minister and, and the Department looking at. Um, as well, uh, we have, in terms of, of, of archaeology, um, I know we have approximately 1.5 million um, finds on archaeological objects that are just sitting in storage somewhere. Uh, and I think that's a terrible waste. And, you know, again, there's no point digging these things up and looking for them if they're just going to be sitting somewhere gathering dust. I might as well have left them in the ground where they were. So, um, you know, I think again I that that might require legislation in terms of how we display those and how we how we allow the public to have access to those. But again, it's it's very important because it's part of our tell the story of of us and who we are. And um, you know, we need to again prioritise things like that. Uh, just picking up, there's been a bit, a bit of discussion about the HED and um, it, while I I concur, they're a very important organisation. I would ask, are the are they are they resourced enough? Or they, do they have the capabilities to carry out the function that they're supposed to do? Because um, members will see in the pack we have today the, the letter from the uh, Friends of Knock Ivy. Um, and what has happened at Knock Ivy is nothing short than a scandal. Um, that, you know, a, a, an important scheduled monument was allowed to be, um, was allowed to be uh, treated and damaged the way that it was. Um, so I, I would question whether um, having, I know there are statutory consultee to planning, but um, you know we need to make sure that first of all the damage to the, the ancient current knock ivy is is rectified, and, and importantly, how do we stop that from happening in the future? So, is there an issue there in terms of HED and, and their their capabilities and their are they resourced enough? Do they have the capability to, to carry out that very important function in terms of protecting our um, our built our our, 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 our Ancient heritage um, from from bad planning decisions, um, and again, it's just in terms of the ALBs in general. Um, and I know this was uh, alluded to in the new decade year approach document um, about a, a review of the arms length bodies. Um, so I wonder has any any thought been given in terms of that um, about bringing some of that expertise back into the department? Um, because I, I, I kind of have a little issue about handing so much percentage of a budget out to an ALB and then being told, sorry, we'll decide how that's been spent. Now, I'm not questioning, um, obviously, these groups of expertise. 
Um, I'm not questioning that a lot of them do a lot of good work, but um, you know, I, I, and you outlined at the start um, more about how you, it's, you know your team has so much expertise and in, in different fields. Um, and I would just like to know has has consideration been given to that? Um, because I, I definitely think, um, and even in terms of the saving, is there any you know th thought as to how much that would actually save the department about bringing some of that expertise <coughs> in house? Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. <laughs> just a few questions. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll I'll. Maybe not pick them up in order, I'll, okay. I'll, because there's a couple I think I could um, answer together. Um, well, on, on your your first point about the arts, um, because in a way we are the department for communities, so everything everything that you say there resonates. That's that's our raison d'être. That's why we do what we do. So absolutely. Um, any investment um, that's made from the public purse, um, whether it is for for sport and physical activity or for the arts, it has to be to benefit the community. And I think certainly um, the minister's made that very clear in terms of um, where she wants to see investment targeted. Um, so I think that's a that's certainly a, a, a point that resonates with uh, what the minister's been saying just so far. Um, the point that you make there about um, arts and music and so on um, perhaps being uh, less prominent in the curriculum, I think that's another, you know, there's a theme coming coming out from the committee uh, this morning which is about making sure that we're joining up sufficiently with our, with our colleagues in other departments and I think actually that's an important one for us to lift around education and just understanding um, where where we see the importance and the prominence of the arts is that um, is that a shared is that a shared understanding uh, with colleagues in other departments and where there are gaps how those gaps have been filled um, on uh, archaeology um, and again um, my my colleagues in HED will be uh, so thrilled that um, that the, the committee has has an interest in this. Uh, one of the one of the things that um, colleagues in HED have been looking at um, is a partnership, obviously, with um, museums to see you know what what are what are what are the scope there, even for on a very practical basis, sort of shared storage and so on. But also, um, we have a, a wider piece of work to do. Um, which is about how, how we are, even within our, as you know, we call it the en engaged communities family, how we are all working together to make sure that we're um, sharing and promoting our assets in the best possible way. So I take your point around that, but um, perhaps we need to um, be more vocal about that and, and, and give people more of an insight into that. Um, your point about resourcing, I think, um, is, is an important one, and I think that that's one um, that we really need to consider now, particularly that ministers um, are back and that we're, um, budgets are being set, to have a very clear understanding of what adequate resourcing in order to meet those statutory requirements looks like, not just in um, Historic Environment Division because clearly um, PRONI, for example, also has a number of statutory responsibilities and making sure that those are adequately resourced. And I think that's uh, a point well made. Um, and that then also links in to your point around arm's length bodies. Obviously, the uh, new decade, new approach had a, a commitment around the review of arm's length bodies. That overall programme will be led by DOF, and um, we're um, we're yet to hear the kind of detail on how that will be taken forward. I would anticipate that departments will be responsible for reviewing their own arm's length bodies, and then we will feed that back as part of a broader programme. Um, Arms length bodies in the past would have been subject to, um, I was thinking, very grand type quinquennial reviews. And again, they would have looked at the, the points that you're making. In some cases, it's really important that a function is at arm's length from government, and, and, and we all understand that. And, I, and um, there's also um, a number a number of considerations that need to be looked at to see you know is an arm's length body um, the appropriate vehicle and for lots of in, in lots of cases it is because um, either for that an element of independence or a specialism or an expertise um, but certainly those are the things that need to be looked at and um, and it will be important for us to work with colleagues in those arm's length bodies uh, as we go through this process um, 
and certainly it will depend on a case by case basis. Um, each of those will be looked at separately on the basis of um, what it is they're delivering and what is the best vehicle for delivering that, both in terms of impact um, but also value for money. Mm. And then the, the, the final one is around uh, physical activity, which uh, again will be music to Catherine's ears because, again, within um, her uh, sports, the remit for sports, I think we, we very, very clear, um, particularly for female participation, that um, physical activity is, uh, is one way into. So, sports sometimes, particularly competitive sports, uh, can be off putting uh, for some people, and really, physical activity, getting more people involved in physical activity, uh, is the goal. And that's why, um, particularly if we think of our um, Active Fit and Sporty, the awards the other evening, how we broaden that out, Catherine, do you maybe want to pick yeah, up on that? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a standalone physical activity strategy, you're quite right, but Sport Matters covers sport and physical recreation. So while there's no doubt there's a space for our elite athletes and for those who are members of clubs, we're also very focused on the other end of the spectrum. And indeed, with Without that, we don't have the feed to become our elite athletes. So we've been engaging with the PHA, uh, with the Department of Health, and actually we had an innovation lab a few weeks ago where we were teasing out the definitions of what is sport, what is physical activity, and how do we build that into our future, future strategy as we move forward. So we are in tune to that. We, we know there's the need, and we are focused on it. Chair, if I might just pick on up on Moira's comments and return in to your first question about can we take a look at the arts that we are funding. Um, we have no strategy for the arts and creativity, and that is a gap that you know, our organisations in the sector would say is a significant gap, because what it can lead to is just the issues that are being um, aired here. That's a space where other departments can be brought in, and where that's clear and resounding sense about what's the public sense of priorities for funding, where that should sit. So it's to make that observation that there isn't a, a strategy for arts and creativity here. And I think you know, it's, it's something um, that many in the sector would welcome being, being introduced. Thank you. Okay, Sinead, Kelly, you wanted a quick supplementary? I have a very, very point. quick supplementary. Uh, um, uh, just, uh, <coughs> sorry, Catherine, when you were talking there about the joined up work of the PHA, can I just ask, one of the biggest issues for women in sport is actually being able to get to it. Um, I was wondering if there's any discussions with infrastructure about access to sport, because public transport in many areas after six o'clock at night doesn't exist. Um, and to be honest, as regards to mental health and enabling people to get there, has there been any discussion into, we had, we've had discussions discussions in the past with infrastructure about the nighttime economy. What about the sports and well-being economy? Um, is there any way that there or have there been any discussions? Not that I'm aware of, but I can cer certainly follow that up. I'm just looking to see here. We were doing some work on what you know the barriers to sport were. I don't know what the particular barriers for women were. I know the top one was actually having somebody to go with. So for females it was very much having a friend or a colleague to attend with. Um, Yes, yeah, so for females it was someone to go with, um, cheaper admission prices, and I suppose this is your point, facilities nearer to home stroke work. For so, able to get to them. Yeah, so certainly we'll be building that into whenever we're doing some engagement for the next sports strategy, so we can certainly take that away. I think I would actually be saying to infrastructure, given the state of our public transport services, we might actually get some more footfall if they enabled people to get to places. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank okay. you. Thank you. Sinead, were you finished there? Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah. moving on. Andy? Thank you, Chair. Um, and I know this has been touched on already and I appreciate obviously the, the freshness of the ruling. You may not be able to go into great detail and it's obviously the Court of Appeal ruling in relation to charities. Um, can you maybe give us some detail on the ramifications of that ruling in respect of the decisions that have been taken, registrations and, and the orders and also the way forward as the department sees it in respect to that ruling also? Well, obviously this is quite fresh. And, uh, and we, we've, we've sought legal advice, and you know we're going to have to consider really, really carefully where we go from here. So, um, unfortunately, I'm not able to give you any more detail on that because of the fact that it, it, is, it is something which we are obviously considering very, very carefully. Um, but we will keep the committee informed, and uh, we absolutely appreciate um, how important this issue is, both for committee members, but more importantly for for people uh, for people on the ground mm -hmm. um, and you know 
clearly any implications will have to be worked through very carefully uh, with, uh, with the Commission. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we are obviously taking our own legal advice as well to make sure we have um, whatever options we put to the Minister, that she has all of the information to consider next steps. Interestingly, you know, at the appeal, the appeal judge did say we need to be very, didn't say cautious, but we need to consider very carefully our next yeah. steps in terms of the significance of these sorts of decisions and the impact that they have. So, you know, you can, you can see that we're Doing naturally very being cautious uh, in terms of uh, next steps. Yeah. And Chair, apologies, I should have declared an interest in respect to that item uh, as a charity trustee myself. Uh, and as a charity trustee and, and having engaged with those who are trustees, there are there is concern amongst uh, the, the voluntary sector in respect of charities. Uh, and I do appreciate the comments in respect of uh, the assurances that those are yet to be registered. And I know it, yeah, I uh, on occasions that can take a lengthy period of time. Um, there, uh, there is no barriers in terms of fundraising and so forth so on. And I, I look forward to potentially a briefing in the future in respect to that. John, ju just very quickly, um, and it'll come as no surprise, I'm sure, um, citywide. Yep. Um, and I've obviously tabled a number of AQWs and, and I've written to the Minister. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be engaging with the Minister next week in respect to that. And certainly uh, a theme that I'm getting in, Carl makes a very good point. Um, while we have obviously yeah. Belfast and we've London Dairy Stroke Dairy in respect of representation for our tribunals, um, there is a disconnect around uh, other areas of the province and certainly other colleagues have highlight highlighted that to me. Certainly Citywide have highlighted an impact in terms of their ability to be able to provide representation and they have a backlog which has resulted in um, that it, our applicants being impacted and it just sort of highlight the, the urgency to try to address that in respect of it and, and highlight how important the independent advice sector is in respect of assisting claimants through the, the minefield that is the social security system. Yeah, uh, and I think um, the Minister would want us to, uh, to, I suppose, reiterate her absolute commitment um, to um, the independent advice sector and she sees obviously appeals as being important within that, uh, right to redress and good quality representation and so on two levels obviously our funding goes out through again local government where we think they're best place to decide on, on need but then we fund then second tier advice through the law centre. The law centre take real challenges to do government policy and have one you'll be aware of the McLaughlin case yeah. and other things so, so um, and they then have a second tier. We fund a number of posts there, two or three posts, just out of the welfare reform pot, to take you know specific um, appeals forward on behalf of individuals. Very aware of the citywide issue, as you would expect. We work closely with council uh, around how the money that we uh, they match fund. We put out the money for um, advice on the ground and how that's distributed. Um, Interestingly, I saw that there was a vote in council two nights ago around if, um, depending on what minister decides on the advice that's on her desk at the minute, around the allocation of additional money for appeals, council voted that they would give £75,000 to Citywide in the event um, that there isn't enough coming from the department in terms of the money that that service needs. But certainly we're aware of the excellent work that they do in the ground. Um, I suppose, again, matter for council at this stage and we'll see what the minister decides in terms of where she's allocating um, the extension of mitigations money, as we're calling it. Yeah, and it's very welcome, um, council's commitment. I know they have funded citywide in the past and they've funded yep. other advice in respect to that. Um, and, and it'll be good to see the department moving forward. And I do appreciate the minister. It is a, an important factor and a priority for the minister in respect to that. Um, in your opening brief, Maura, you you'd mentioned uh, social supermarkets and the five pilots. Um, just maybe, is there, and, and obviously uh, food poverty uh, continues to be a massive issue and that's been compounded, uh, if you want, by welfare reform and, and indeed in work um, poverty. 
uh, is there any plan to extend um, those those pilots or, or, or build upon that? It's mine as well, yep. Andrew. Um, that again, <laughs> you'll be thinking I'm being obstructive. No, yep. um, that's in uh, the advice because that came out of the welfare mitigations report as well, yep. Eileen's report, if you remember, and it was to look at innovative approaches to, to uh, food poverty. You'll all be aware, obviously, of um, the growth of food banks in Northern Ireland. This is, this was seen as a more sustainable response, I suppose. Only one response to food poverty, which is really poverty, you know, it's just through, through that lens. And um, it's a relatively small investment for something that we're five pilots. Um, there's one in Derry, London Derry, Coleraine, Straban, Belfast, Lisburn. Um, very small investment on behalf of the department, about 400 odd K. Um, people pay, but a fi you know, small nominal fee, five pounds. Um, and, and as a result of that, then they get access to food. The food comes in through Food Share. You're aware of that charity that uses unused food from supermarkets and, and other outlets. Um, so we, we do uh, part fund that from uh, uh, Food Share. And the outcomes, as Maura said earlier, in terms of their re there's a wraparound service around that, so people are encouraged to eat healthily, cook healthily. They're connected into other services in terms of money management, financial capability, and all of that. Our early evaluation is really encouraging, really good. We have provided some advice to the Minister about a number of options. Um, she's considering that at the minute. But the overall investment, if, if, for example, you were to think about that going across Northern Ireland, wouldn't be that high. You're not talking about much more than a million, 1.2 million um, annually. But again, yeah, you were, we're waiting for decisions on that. Hey, thanks very much. Just just two, two further points, Chair. Um, I declare interest in respect to someone who is involved in disability sports. Um, certainly from my involvement in disability sports and with constituents, there's, there's a feeling uh, amongst the, the wider disability sports community that the availability of disability sports is not um, to the same extent of that as counterparts in the rest of the United Kingdom um, and other areas. Uh, and just maybe what work's being done in, in respect of that to enhance the offering uh, and the availability of different disability sports. We are continuing to work with, with disability sport and we meet with them fairly routinely and I think one of the issues has been in terms of trained coaches, so trained people, the equipment's there but it took quite a long time to get people trained that were suitable to, to deliver the facilities. So we have a number of coaches now in place across the councils. We can see the sports growing, the likes of wheelchair basketball, there's a new club's now been set up in Bangor Aurora, there's a league that's been set up. So the offering is growing. Mm -hmm. um, having met our Scottish colleagues, they were seeing something here that they don't have in Scotland and they took that back you know, to follow up there. Um, I'm not sure what the offering is elsewhere, but it's certainly an area that we're focused on and we engage with disability sport very regularly. And we would like to grow that. I yeah, think it's absolutely. Really, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's back to this theme of um, inclusion yeah. and it's, that runs through the heart of, of what we do. And, and we're, we're always open. If there's ways that we could be doing more, better, different, then you know we, we want to hear that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And certainly I've uh, come to appreciate the, the benefits of being involved in sport and indeed of, of colleagues and friends who are now getting involved also. Uh, and indeed it's imperative in part of us as um, community representatives to, to build on that, that offering. Um, just very quickly, the sub-regional stadia programme. And I know I've been engaging with the Minister in relation to this uh, and she has highlighted uh, the change in the landscape and she's, uh, there's been engagement with um, stakeholders in respect to that. Is there any further development in respect to that? And we'll appreciate obviously um, clubs have been waiting a considerable amount of time in respect to this and I do appreciate we have to get it right but um, I'd like to see that funding being disseminated down out onto the ground. Yeah, I mean, you obviously appreciate the, the consultation was done on a 2011 facility strategy. Things have changed. It's been almost 10 years. So we had some initial engagement for Christmas. Um, we have recently established a joint working group, um, which actually met for the first time yesterday. So at the moment, we're engaging with the IFA, NIFL, Sport Safety Ground, Sport NI. We will look to widen that engagement across the sector as, as we develop plans. As you say, it's quite a significant investment. We want to make sure we get it right. Nobody no doubts the need for the investment. Mm -hmm. It's just to make sure that it meets the current needs and, almost more importantly, the future needs of the game, particularly around female participation, disability participation, a lot of things we've been talking about today. Yeah, and, I, and I suppose just, just to add to that, um, 
we're trying to balance the um, the hunger and the appetite that's out there to get this moving alongside the fact that we, we really need to make sure that we do get it right. Um, so we will be moving at pace, but we appreciate that um, it, it, you know there's uh, there's certainly high levels of interest and, and, and we're getting that and um, we'll just have to do do our very best to work with the the, the football family as as we we seek to progress this to put options to the minister okay i look forward to seeing that delivered very soon then <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much thank hey, you thanks, Andy. i know you had a supplementary johnny but you're down on the list still to speak so yeah no it's, it's not it's, fun. No, is that I, okay i, I can hold off you i'll Mark's. move on because uh, we've robin then emma then yourself yeah, johnny and then mark so robin <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. My, my questions are quite specific, so uh, they'll be short. Um, within the area of the culture and the work that's being done on sign language, uh, and that's actually super, um, is there anything being done on, in the area for those who have visual impairments uh, in order to the same level of communication uh, with them? Uh, I did want to ask you about the, the stadia. Um, Andrew has already uh, raised that one. The other area, in the areas of um, uh, deprivation and trying to tackle social disadvantage where there are pockets, um, and uh, I, I go back to my days on Belfast City Council even, when it was a, a difficult one to challenge because often small pockets of deprivation are masked by pockets of influence, of affluence, or uh, they sit alongside it. So can I ask what, what, what work is being done? How successfully is that being tackled in order to make sure that the less well-off area is not disadvantaged because it's uh, adjacent to, uh, to a, 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 a prosperous area? Okay. So I'm going to pick up on your, your first point. Um, so you, you raised the point about um, visual impairments. So the, the team that works with MAVE is a languages team, yes. which is why sign language is, is part of that. Uh, In terms of the other, so what you're talking about there is communication. So for Well, I would barely see language as a communication. Yeah, but you, 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 you understand, and, and I, I, I appreciate they, uh, they, the, the lens can sometimes look artificial in terms of, of how, how we work, but th that, that team is, is focused exclusively on those, those three those languages. Three areas, okay. But I absolutely take your point, and it goes back again, and you, you'll see this as a, as a, in a thread of all the work that we do, which is about access and inclusion. And we have um, a fund for access and inclusion that will include, um, it's, a, it's a capital fund that will be about anything at all in terms of the sectors that we support, how we improve access and inclusion, and that would include making sure that signage is um, appropriate for t to ensure that they, the greatest number of people um, can access and enjoy the facilities that we have, and, and certainly that those will be availed of um, cultural centres, sports centres, in order to make sure that people with a range of disabilities are able to access and enjoy those services. So absolutely take your point that that's an important element of it. Um, you might want to think about communication with other departments in terms of the Braille area. It's it's not a, I mean, there's accent work done by the, uh, in the uh, pedestrian crossings where a blind person can actually touch underneath and, and be aware of, 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 of how to signal and so on. But th there is a lack of, of uh, point joined upness that is, is not happening. Yeah, I, and I, I think, you know, again, that's, that's a key theme. And as um, some members of the committee are aware, my last role was in the Department for Infrastructure and I had responsibility for um, accessible transport. So. Um, the, the joining up point is something that's very close to my heart here, and um, and certainly I think that's that's yet another um, I think that's yet yet another subject where it is really really important that every department's pulling on the same rope. Um, this is just, do, do you actually have any engagement with either RNIB or guide dogs or any? Do you have that engagement? We have engagement through the. I'm just trying to think. We have engagement with the. Um, MTAC, 
which is um, a committee of, and I, 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 can, I can never remember how to... Inclusive Capability Transport Advisory Committee. There you go. <laughs> and so, so MTAG, which is a, a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful organisation, a committee that represents people with a whole range of, uh, a whole range of um, mobility issues and, and disabilities. And in fact, I had a, a meeting with MTAC members just before Christmas about some of these points because because um, again, um, one of one of the things that we've been we've been seeking to do, and certainly our, our permanent secretary has been uh, very strong on this, is how can we be inclusive by design? So if we begin every, and particularly given that the Department for Communities, um, the reach that we have, you know, it's a, as you're uh, you're all. Uh, so acutely aware, it's a huge department, a huge reach. So if when we are designing our services and facilities, if we are inclusive by design, if we begin at the beginning and think very, very carefully, so we're not then coming to retrofit. And so, I mean, one of the one of the things that we um, if even think about in the last year, um, libraries, um, libraries and museums thinking about when they're doing refurbishment to include changing places facilities um, to make sure that again more more of our um, more of our citizens more of our families can access and enjoy the services that we have um, and I, I think that's a really important point and something that um, we, we need to ha hardwire into our thinking and particularly given that our department will lead on um, the disability strategy so it's more important, I think, that, that we get it right. You know, we, we, we need to be leading by example. So absolutely, uh, absolutely agree with you on that. On the, the, the pockets of deprivation, again, you raise um, a really interesting point about the future of neighbourhood renewal because um, that's one of the things that we'll be looking at in terms of the review. Uh, one of the things that we were hearing back from people um, was particularly about how boundaries are drawn and the idea that you could be... Um, able to access um, services or opportunities because you live on one side of the street, but when you're on the other side of the street that you can't. So that's something that um, we heard very clearly in terms of those engagements and something that we will then need to be building into the future options. And again, coming back to the fact that spatial deprivation, po poverty is much broader than that. Spatial deprivation obviously is a, a really, really important pillar, but then there are issues, as you say, about either pockets or indeed individuals, people who um, are living in a, a well-to-do area who have, as an individual, fallen on hard times. So all, all of those elements will need to be considered. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Robin. Emma? Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for your presentation. Um, I just have a, a couple of questions. So firstly, um, in relation to, obviously, Sinead touched on some of the ALBs that the department has um, oversight of. In NDNA, obviously, there's the establishment of language commissioners. Mm -hmm. And for the Irish language commissioner in particular, it states that there's, there's going to be a, a commitment from them to work with the agencies that are already set up and involved in Irish language, namely for us. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered, obviously, co-design is a big theme throughout NDNA and, and working in comparison together and in partnership. Um, so I just wondered if for us we're being properly resourced to do this and what, what the, the the role has been thus far and if there's if there's been involvement and, and cooperation. Sure I I'll, I'll just maybe respond um, immediately Emma, and then I'll, I'll I'll hand over to Maeve. So um, one of the things that we're working through with colleagues in the executive office is how the Office for um, Identity and Cultural Expression will relate to um, our policy responsibilities within the department and, and what the relationship will be, for example, between Forest and the Ulster Scots Agency and the Language Commissioners. And I think there's a, a good model in other jurisdictions that we can draw upon to show how those relationships will work and how where the responsibilities lie. So obviously, um, there's a there's a, a timetable there in in the um, the and NDNA that's you know uh, fairly brisk. I think fair to say so. Uh, we will need to be working at pace and working closely with colleagues, and, and certainly um, 
the role that the two organisations, Forest and, and the Ulster Scots Agency, the role that they're going to play as that work develops is hugely, hugely important. Maybe, do you maybe want to pick up on some of the conversations that you've been having around that? So we are um, actively at the moment um, beginning to take a look at you know what would be in strategies because that's the ask of us as a team is to bring forward strategies on Irish language and Ulster Scots and the agreement document set out the timescale for doing that mm -hmm. and again on this it's an area where some work has been done previously so it's not that it's starting off from a, an entirely uh, blank sheet of paper. Yes. On the point about the funding for Forest and indeed the Ulster Scots Agency, um, the, the, the point is made by those organisations that the fact that the North South Ministerial Council has not been meeting has been, uh, as they assess, to their detriment. Um, and, you know, I have no doubt that when that body begins to meet again, that that will be an issue that they will put firmly on their agenda. Um, so, you know, in answer to the question, do they have sufficient resource? I think, you know, um, they're doing a fine job, um, but they, like so many others, would like to see more resource. And, and my expectation is that will make its way onto the agenda of the NSMC. I, mean, I well, just know from the closure of Pobble, it was last year, the year before. And I'm, I'm assuming there were implications then on the ground. In relation to that, I know that that was because yeah. of funding. Um, the minister, I should add as well that the minister is being briefed by Forrest in the incoming week, has a okay. meeting um, with them, and I think you know we'll have a, a, a clearer picture after that meeting. Yeah, no, I just I, I know it's written into the deal, but it makes sense that if there's a group already engaged in the promotion of the Irish language, that they should have. Um, some contribution into what the commissioner is doing. Um, just following on from that, um, Chair, I have one or two more wee questions that are probably more local. Um, so, obviously, I know Sport NA are a, a, another um, sort of ALB, if you want to call them that, and there's a particular event that it actually affects my own constituency and East Derry and West Tyrone, so it goes across the three, which is run by Club Derry, which is technically a GAA um, organisation, and they're a funding organisation, but the event is Man of Spare, and it's probably... I do. Huh? I'm aware of it. Too. Aye. So, it's Man of Spare, it's like a cycling competition, and it goes right through the Spairns, um, no surprise. But there's massive tourism potential in, the, in this event, and Whilst, yes, it ultimately is, is a funding event for the GEA, it's really inclusive and attracts uh, visitors from across the north and has started now to, to, to get um, people competing from Scotland and England as well. And they're coming there for the scenery and all the rest of it. They've not been able to avail of Sport NA funding because it's not a capital project and it's, it's GA and it's funded by GA and it's for the promotion of GA, yes. So I'm just wondering if there's, whilst I understand obviously that there is set certain criteria, I just think like tourism, and I know again that's a separate department that they deal with, but there's, there's sort of a perception in our own area that tourism for the north is like the Causeway Coast and Belfast, and then visitors then go to Donegal, which is all. They're lovely places, but the whole sort of middle region sort of is seen as like the poor cousin a wee bit. And I know, like we've got the opening of the Dava uh, project now, not far from from where I am from, and that's funded by council, and is set to bring in loads of of, uh, of visitors too. But it's, it's EU stroke council funding. So I just I just wondered if there was I I, I would like to say we could have a conversation about. I suppose what I'll start by saying is funding of events lies with tourism, not with the Department yes. of Communities, so we don't have the varies to fund events. What we do look at is the legacy around the event, so inclusion, participation, what that's doing for the sport, but we are in a position where we can't provide funding for events. There are obviously grant schemes for Tourism NI. Yeah. Um, I don't have the details to hand, but we no, can get them for you. I suppose there's a legacy issue with this event. How long has it been going, Emma? Oh, three, four years. Uh, uh, it's less than ten years. So, yeah, so there is there's some sort of legacy uh, there. It's, but it's 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 cycling. Yeah. 
you know, it's the promotion of cycling and then through the spares. Yeah, so I suppose what we'd be looking at is how do we get more people into cycling? So what does that do for the marginalised yeah. communities to get them into cycling? So I suppose nothing has reached me as of yet. Happy to talk about it, but I would say events okay. falls outside us. I might follow up with you on that. The other thing then was the Haney Home Place. Um, so Haney Home Place... I know that there was some negative publicity around it after it was first opened, but I think the first two years that they hit nearly 80,000 in terms of visitors. Getting 500k every year from Mid Ulster Council for running costs. And I know what, when I'm meeting with Chief Exec of our council, they're saying the Mac Theatre in Belfast is getting the best part of a million pound year on year from um, the Arts Council. They're also getting funding from Belfast City Council. And Heaney Home Place has the potential to, well it is, it's delivering those same sort of arts events as well as the tourism which again I know is separate but I mean the, if you even look at Blahey as a place since it opened and the regeneration there's cafes and restaurants that have opened and sort of done up their businesses as a result so it is it is attracting visitors but it probably could do a whole lot more um, but they're, they're, they've, they had the door closed on them from the Arts Council I'm just wondering yeah, well, and I, I suppose, so, uh, laid off by saying, and it's, it's kind of back to the, the point you were making earlier about what's, what's appropriate for a department and what's appropriate for an arm's length body. So, the legislation that um, establishes and, and sets out the relationship between the Arts Council and the department makes it really clear that the department should not get involved in the decisions around where that funding um, ought to go. So it, and you know, they would say that's why you have an arts council with people with the expertise around the table that, that make the decisions on funding. Um, and I, I suppose, you know, not not to say, um, you know, it sounds as if we're saying, you know, that's uh, not our job, but it is. It is actually very, very clear in the legislation um, that the arts council needs to be left to make those decisions independently on the basis of what they can deem to be artistic merit. And is that is that probably fair to say, me if? It is, and also to say, I mean, I've met with Brian McCormick in the um, Haney Home Place. I think that the distribution, that which is Belfast based, and you know, um, and that supported outside, is a very live issue for many organisations in the sector. Absolutely. And I think it's one that you know we may need to come back to in in other um, conversations. There's been no ask of the department um, from Haney Home Place. Um, and you know, if something were to come our way, then we'd certainly take a look at it. And um, within that um, constraint that Moira has talked about, that decisions on artistic um, decisions on programming are for the Arts Council to take. But that said, it's an organisation that has wider impact, mm. and certainly they would argue regional significance. Absolutely. And so, so they haven't made any request into the department. Not of the department. Right. So it must just be then the Arts Council. I'm just wondering then, like, and I know what you're saying that they have like jurisdiction that's separate from the department. But if there's departmental um, priorities, are they? Is there like? Is there a, a means that you have of reviewing whether or not they're? So through you, Chair, that takes me back to the point I made earlier. Are there departmental priorities? There's yeah, no sure specific strategy for arts and creativity. So to that extent, there are no specific departmental priorities for investment in arts and creativity. Um, the departmental priorities are those that are set out in the programme for government. And, and we rely on those. And the Arts Council will have its own pro uh, programming priorities, which of course they share with us as they share uh, and, and, and bring their strategies to us. But there, are, there is certainly um, a, you know, a number of organisations in the sector, um, if, if we look at grant distribution patterns where a small number of organisations, very significant organisations, doing really important work, but in, 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 in reality they consume a significant part of the Arts Council's budget. And so when we talk to organisations in the sector, um, something that they would like to see is some thought being given across departments as to this notion of portfolio funding. You know, might, might a better approach be to take out of that funding pot those organisations that are agreed to be of regional significance and in a sense treat them differently? <coughs> 
because the very small local community-based organisations <coughs> can feel strongly that in that mix they're overlooked. Question: mm -hmm. Do you want to make a small well, intervention? I, I, yeah, it's just in terms of that. So, uh, why there? You know, there's no art strategy. It was alluded to that the, there are ministerial um, priorities. Um, and it's and again getting back to that the issue about the ALBs and my my issue of you know who's who's checking that the money that the, the department are giving to the ALBs and specifically we're talking about the Arts Council here that they're meeting the minister's priorities because I know her priorities are in terms of objective need and, and regional balance. Um, so you know what I what I understand there's legislation that you know the, there's there can't be any interference. Um, but there has to be some sort of oversight, so the department can say, "Look, we don't yeah. feel that you know, or well, there's no strategy. The minister has priorities, and her, her priorities are this. And are you meeting those priorities?" So absolutely, um, and you know, under the governance arrangements for any arms length body, it's for ministers to sign off on the annual plans and the strategic plans of those bodies of arms length bodies. The minister has asked us to arrange an early engagement with the Arts Council and with organisations in the arts sector and we're in the process right now of getting that set up um, and that will be happening over the next short number of weeks and I think that creates an opportunity to, to, you know, for the Minister to set out her thinking very clearly and for organisations to have that discussion and dialogue. And it, you know, I'm back to that point. Um, you know, it is fairly early days in the mandate, and for some of the things that we've been talking about, there's work that's already been done. Where you know we're 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 lifting it and going with that, Minister. Um, we were we were briefing the minister recently um, on a number of issues, and one of the things that she asked for a dedicated session on was um, was arts, culture, creativity, and thinking about the fact that there is this strategy gap and and. Um, to give an opportunity for her to consider how we ought to be taking um, this area of our work forward. So it might be that the, the minister would ask us to develop a strategy that's very much in keeping with the um, with the priorities that she's set out so far, which has been very much on the basis of um, objective need, um, inclusion, regional balance, and, and all of that. Um, but no, the. The, the, the point the point is um, the point is understood uh, in particular about making sure that all that that we do and all that the the community's family all that we do is, is absolutely aligned against the the priorities that the the minister set in for us thank you Johnny thank you chair um, it was to go back to a previous point in relation to the charity commission um, there is a lot of concern regarding the recent ruling um, not only with voluntary and community, but again throughout uh, political circles as well. This decision has the potential to be much more wide-ranging uh, in relation to other decisions that were taken uh, by the Charity Commission in the period of 2011 to 2009. They could be seen as unlawful decisions. That causes even more concern when we consider that potential registration of charities throughout that time as well may be unlawful. Um, has the Minister uh, or the Department contacted those groups that may be concerned? Uh, is, has there been feedback to them uh, in relation to these potential unlawful decisions? Because it's causing, I know Andy has said it, it's causing me great concern, uh, but I know many uh, community and charity organisations, again, that have been in contact with me uh, relating, relating to the concern that there is out there. Well, I, th I think the fact that, you know, that, that message has been heard across the committee. I think it will be important for us to consider whether there is a communication gap there mm -hmm. and whether even in, in the fact that you know, we, we don't have anything concrete at the moment to say because we are considering the implications of the judgment and taking, uh, taking advice on that. But we will take away from today whether or not there ought to be some form of communication with, um, with people in the sector mm -hmm. and uh, whether that's through the Commission or from ourselves, but we, we, we certainly hear what you're saying on that. So, so ha has there been direct contact with those uh, charity organisations that may be affected by this, this this decision? My understanding at this point is no. There is information on the Charity Commission's website. As Maura said, we're obviously working through the judgement and the implications, which you're right, could be quite mm. fundamental and, and, and obviously are highly significant. And we are taking further legal advice. 
We did have early advice around, um, you know, the presumption of validity of previous decisions um, until they would be challenged individually. But again, we're taking our own advice uh, again on the appeal judgment, and and therefore and bringing forward options for the minister to consider in terms of the way forward. And we're doing that cautiously, as you can imagine, given what the uh, uh, appeal judge advised. I, I think it would be important for for that communication gap to be filled uh, via the department. Um, and sure, if it is in order, I, I do think that this committee, when appropriate, I know there's still uh, legal considerations, but I, I think it would be. Uh, salient and important for this committee to hear directly from the Charities Commission or those responsible in relation to steps, uh, next steps following this judgment, because it does cause great concern. Yeah, I, I think I said that at the outset, that I think we do need to have a, a full brief on this, though I do want to give enough time for you, know, for you to do the work that you have to do um, in order to see what the results of that, that are. Um, so. Yeah, uh, yes, in your answer to that, but it's looking at the time scale for that, because there's no point getting you in next week to discuss it or the week after, I would imagine. It's going to take a wee while for you to work through what you have to do as well. So if you're, in a, yeah, that would be absolutely. Um, we will look at that. Um, Mark? Cheers, Chair. Uh, thank you, ladies, for your presentation and, and your patience. I think it's, it's no exaggeration to say we could actually spend a session on each slide. It probably feels to you like, like we have. <laughs> but there's a, a lot of great work obviously being done and a lot of good news in there, which is probably why we don't hear that much uh, uh, about it. Top of my list had been the fact that the, or, well, the lack of the arts uh, strategy, uh, and I can't let today pass, and others <laughs> have said it or intimated it, but uh, without, I suppose, conveying the frustration that's felt by groups within my own constituency, good and established uh, groups working in the arts and culture, uh, that, that there's huge frustration. I suppose that there's an organisation there, Arts Council, uh, who are not just deciding what art is but also where uh, art is, and, and, and there are issues there that, that I think certainly uh, would need addressed. That there is a, certainly a perception, a well-founded one in my opinion, that, 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 that it is too Belfast-focused. Uh, in terms of the regional, or sorry, sub-regional stadia issue, you spoke to Catherine about speaking to the, the football family. I think, as you put it, and you, you mentioned uh, the, the FAI, and they're not the only association in town. And uh, now, I haven't had time to time to, to dissect fully uh, answers that the minister ha, ha, has given on this issue. But I've heard a lot of talk of, of, of the AFA, and I just want to establish that the Brandywell Stadium will be eligible for an application based from Councillor Dairy City Football Club. Obviously, we don't yet have conditions set around the programme, but it's certainly anticipated that any club that's eligible, that's situated in Northern Ireland, will be able to apply. Regardless so of the association. So there's no reason to assume that the Brandywell wouldn't. Oh, okay, doke. Okay. And touching on the point that Emma made, or, or expanding on it a bit, I have a great deal of sympathy, where, where you have sometimes events that tick a lot of boxes, they don't fall neatly in, in, into any. I think of the, the, the foil cup in my own constituency, which the department have. I generously supported in the past, but every year it's it's sort of a a, a struggle <laughs> around a number of departments to see uh, who will cough up. Um, in, in terms of uh, neighbourhood re renewal, and I, I welcome, I suppose, that, that the minister has indicated that that budget will be protected. I, I saw it on Twitter last weekend, but. The evaluation that was carried out six years ago, has anything changed since then? Do you know, were the recommendations that came out of this evaluation? Uh, I, I think I picked up, it's fair enough to say, more that it, it wasn't exactly glowing. Do you know, and we do recognise that there are shortcomings in the system. I have often, I suppose, lamented the, the lack of buy-in from other statutory agencies, but I don't think that's necessarily the, the only problem there, much similar to the arm's length bodies, where, where you know, they're being funded by the department, but the, there are questions as to regards full accountability, and what uh, responsibility does the department take for recruitment and deployment, 
practices and things like that. There, there are partnership boards in, in, in my area that were elected, I think, in 2005, and, and there hasn't been any election uh, since. And when neighbourhood renewal was designed to close gaps within communities, I have a genuine uh, fear that it has actually Creed. created uh, chasms w within communities and uh, b between communities uh, uh, as well. So I, I, I think the model looked great on paper. However, in practice, I, I don't think it has delivered as it would. And as we move forward, and maybe regeneration does eventually, or, or even this function as well, goes to councils. You know, are, are there lessons that have been learned? I, I see now the community planning partnership in, in my own council area, and I fear a wee bit that it's almost going to repeat the mistakes of neighbourhood renewal, and it would be helpful, I suppose, if if we could have a, a an in-depth analysis at some stage of the evaluation so those lessons can properly be learned r r rather than just uh, repeated. Okay. Right. Um, so on the on the neighbourhood renewal pace, I think it's fair to say that when the the, the, the three year gap that we had without ministers obviously, you know, you, you you can't take forward any significant um, any significant review or change. It wouldn't be appropriate without um, political mandate. On neighbourhood renewal, the evaluation thus far has demonstrated, you know, just as you say, it's there, there are um, mixed results. So a lot of strengths, a lot of things that demonstrate that there is solid merit in the principle and indeed a lot of the practice that we see uh, in neighbourhood renewal practices across the region, but indeed that it didn't live up to perhaps its full potential and certainly the, the things that you're raising are things that we've heard. Um, community planning, you know, the, the landscape has changed just absolutely as you refer to, the fact that we do have community planning now, the fact that we do have an outcomes based programme for government, which gives us the chance to realign some of the practice. now. I would say very clearly, while the Minister has been very alive to um, the reality uh, for people who have been, um, that their, their jobs have been funded through neighbourhood renewal, she's very alive to the fact that um, that uncertainty that people have been living with, that that's really, really difficult. Um, she's very conscious of um, terms and conditions and uh, workers' rights, very, very conscious of that. But we would also be very uh, conscious of the fact that we are not the employer as the department. So um, as we move forward with this review, we'll have to be, um, that's one of the things that we'll need to look really carefully at, is in terms of how those funding mechanisms work, that we are not stepping into the space of an employer because that just wouldn't be appropriate. But how do we, just as you say, get the appropriate um, accountability around um, how some of the uh, the funding is discharged and some of the projects are funded, um, and that is something else that we're looking at more generally within the sector. We, we kind of touched on it earlier, in that, driven by particularly annual budgets, we feel that we've been putting um, perhaps unnecessary burdens on those applying for funding because they're having to. Um, fill out forms for us and have um, a governance regime for us that, from their point of view, feels a lot more onerous than, for example, um, if you look at uh, lotteries. So we've been having discussions with, in particular, uh, Kate Beggs recently to see, is there anything that we can learn from the way that, that because the, the things that they're funding, the areas that they're funding, is very, very similar to a lot of the things that, that this mm -hmm. department funds. Mm -hmm. So when we speak to people on the ground, and indeed I, um, I had, I've had a number of conversations where people have you know, produced the forms that we ask for, and then, you know, which is, you know, they get a wheelbarrow and they you know, lift it out, and then they, the very light touch approach that, that's taken by some other funders, and they're saying to me, why, why, why does this need to be? And that's something that we do need to look at. And similarly, um, I think the, the other thing that we need to look at is particularly, and again, even if we start with our, our DFC family, the housing executive, um, 
has funding programmes that would be very closely aligned to some of the things that we fund, you know, is there a way that we could join up better, um, even with the DFC family and then beyond, again, if you take it another step, the Public Health Agency is another example where we're all funding very, very similar things. We're maybe setting different time scales, setting different standards, different returns, and we're putting that burden on organisations that are already very, very stretched and doing uh, work in the grassroots and actually what are we doing to enhance the work that we do um, and what are we doing perhaps inadvertently that is actually detracting from that because um, because of the way that we are fulfilling a governance regime so those are things that we need to look really carefully at You're quite right okay thank you um, I just just want to finish on one. Sure. oh sorry Go sorry on. I know you've been very generous do you mind if I just come in with a so it's just a wee point of clarity on um, Mark's question about the sub-regional. So um, you, you mentioned any club would be able to apply if they meet the eligibility criteria. Um, we just, my question is around the eligibility criteria because I know um, uh, previously the designated grounds list was a factor there. So there, there's clubs that are currently in NIFL who aren't on that um, designated grounds and yes. I suppose, as I said at the start as well, we don't know what the eligibility criteria are yet, but yeah. that's certainly something we're attuned to yeah. and we'll be taking into consideration. Yeah, no, just to make that point, because um, again, if we were to go on previous criteria and the, the obviously that legislation probably needs updated um, before the rollout of any sub-regional um, monies, um, because if it wasn't, then in terms of, we, when we spoke about the Minister's priorities in terms of objective need and regional balance, that would not fit, you know, um, if we if we went with what was before. So it's just to make that point. I know you can't. It's not. Um, we're talking about something that doesn't exist. Yet. So <laughs> um, it's certainly it's something, it's something we're aware of, and okay. I'd happily take that back. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Janine. Um, so I just said I just want to finish on. Um, you talked there about the DFC family, and certainly with an engaged community, so it's an engaged community family. And it's just really to ask for you know your commitment for that increased collaboration. Um, with the voluntary and community sector. We know as, as constituency MLAs the excellent work that they do um, when it comes to especially to sports and to the arts as well and, um, and also those that are acting in a, a voluntary and community capacity that maybe aren't part of that sector also um, that are doing that very much that, that grassroots work. It's just to ask you know, for that, that that would continue and, and increase um, going forward, that they are they are involved in, in much of that decision making. And in fact, in many cases, our, our colleagues in the, the the voluntary community sector are leading the way. And you know that's the thing that we're we're very conscious of that um, we have a lot to learn and a lot to listen to in terms of both. And, and, and this is this is one of the things I think we've become quite conscious of recently when we have been talking to people and reflecting on what are the behaviours that we are incentivising either consciously or unconsciously through how, how government um, how government sets like, funding criteria, how we then operate the governance regimes and really listening to the impact that we're having and, and these are our partners in terms of delivering many of the um, Many of the priorities that are in both um, the you know the draft programme for government and beyond that, um, particularly our engaged communities group, we we are very externally facing, and we're very lucky to work with um, very vibrant sectors, heritage, arts, and voluntary community sector across the board. Um, and I think particularly is particularly opposite. I think when we're we're going to the joint forum this afternoon. Um, we, we do want to reset that relationship and we do want to make sure um, that what we put in place is co-designed and, and takes us into, um, particularly I think where um, we know that we've limited resources and that budgets have been under pressure, that we make sure that we're not building in any unnecessary bureaucracy, that we're actually targeting, making sure that the, the the, the bulk of people's time, the bulk of people's energy can be targeted on making a difference, which is, you know, what, what we're here to do. Look, thank you. Can I thank you on behalf of the committee for a very detailed um, witness session? I think we have gone across the entire country in many of the questions <laughs> and across such a vast and varied amount of subjects. So thank you very much.
and we look forward to seeing you in the, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, we're going to move on then to agenda item number seven, which is a legislative consent motion, Westminster Pension Schemes Bill. Um, members have been provided at page 91 with correspondence in relation to the legislative consent motion on the Westminster Pension Schemes Bill. The bill was introduced on the 7th of January 2020, with second reading on the 28th of January 2020, and committee stage in the House of Lords begins. House of Lords begins began rather on the 24th of February. The bill includes provisions which relate to develop matters devolved. or sorry, devolved, devolved matters, matters subject to executive approval. It is intended to this seek support. I know, I know. <laughs> it is intended to seek support for a legislative consent motion to enable the Westminster Pension Scheme Bill to legislate for some aspects of private pensions in Northern Ireland. The department has offered to provide officials um, to brief on the le legislative consent motion at a future meeting. Can I ask our members content to receive the departmental briefing on the 12th of March? Go ahead. Yes, but Jar, I don't think it's proper order that we've been asked to, you know, give approval to this LCM without seeing any detail. It's, you know, it's bizarre. Well, there's lots of, yeah, there's lots of de too much detail there. <laughs> no, sir, this is not been asked to give approval. Just certainly not yet. Hasn't I, I don't believe it's even no. gone to the executive. No. no I, I think we're going to be asked to consent to something without seeing detail. But I think we've been asked to <coughs> consent to get evidence, are we? Yeah. yeah. That's all we're being asked for. Yeah. Just to take a briefing yeah. on the details of the actual bill. Uh, so just so to, to take a briefing on that. Allow us to bill. decide. Yeah, because the, 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 yeah. the, the LCM has not been laid yet. So, it's, yes. so that will come forward then um, after the briefing then? Whenever it gets to the executive and the executive degree, it'll be laid at some point after that. So this is just in, it, it before that happens that we would receive a briefing on it first, yeah. before yeah, any consent is, is asked for. But it hasn't passed through the stages of in Westminster, so we're going to be given consent to something that hasn't been debated or thrashed out. You know, we're, at a future uh, date, we will be asked to give yeah. consent to this without seeing how it's panned out in in Westminster. I think, Chair, that the, the officials next week will explain issues in respect of the timing of both the bill that's going through Westminster and the implications for uh, the LCM not being agreed to here in time, because the possibility is then that, the, that, this, that this institution would have to take forward a bill of its own. And otherwise, people here will fall behind in respect of aspects of their, their private pensions relative to others in other parts of the, of the UK. But well, officials next week will be able to explain all of that in detail. Okay, fair enough. <coughs> yep. Okay. Well, I'd, so, sh I'd share your concerns. Yeah, yeah our members are content we get that briefing then next week, yeah. yes? <coughs> okay, then we'll move on to agenda item eight, which is proposals for supporting that legislation. Um, we now move to proposals for secondary legislation. Members have been provided with a memo outlining the purpose of each proposed rule at page 392. Um, the first proposal for consideration is SL1, the Pensions Protection Fund and Occupational Pension Scheme Levy Ceiling and Compensation Cap Order Northern Ireland 2020, and that's at page 394. Can I ask members if there any comments or queries on this? No, therefore, are members content that this will be made? Agreed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We then move on to agenda item 9 which is SL1, the Guaranteed Minimum Pension Increase Order, Northern Ireland 2020. I'm referring to members to page 399 of their packs. Can I ask our members content or do they have any queries on this? No. Nope. Okay, so are members content they will be made? Okay. okay, thank you. Agenda item 10, SL1, the Social Security Revaluation of Earnings Factor Order, Northern Ireland 2020. Refer members to page 405 of their meeting packs and ask again any comments or queries on this? No? Okay. Can I then ask our members' content for the rule to be made? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'm going to move then on to agenda item 11, which is SL1, the Automatic Enrolment Earnings Trigger and Qualifying Earnings Band Order Northern Ireland 2020. I refer members to page 413 of their meeting pack. Can I ask members any comments or queries on this? No? 
Okay. Are members then content that this will be made? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Then we move on to agenda item 12, SL1, the Occupational and, Pension and Personal Pension Scheme General Levy Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. It's at page 418 of your meeting pack. Can I ask our members any comments or queries on this? No? no. Okay. Then I'd ask our members content for the rule to be made. Yes. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, then we'll then move on and we need to reconsider several proposals for secondary legislation. These were originally considered at um, the meeting on the 27th where members had queries on whether the lump sum and payment would have an effect on the payment of universal credit. The Department's response is at page 423. The response states that these rules have been in place for many years and have been carried forward to universal credit. The introduction of an assessment period in universal credit has no impact on relation to this matter. Um, can I ask if members any comments they wish to make on the Department's response? On that, or are they satisfied with the response? I think as long as we know now that, that these lump sum payments, um, you know, don't have an impact, then that that's fine. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank, thank, thank you. I mean, you want to do? chair? I just have this audit. Okay. Yes. Now, so I know it's Evans. I've been told Evans last meeting, and we wish you very well. Emma. Thank you very much. We'll miss you. So we will. You'll, you'll, have to send us, again, you'll have to send us three memos on that Ulster. <laughs> oh, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, where were we there? Okay, agenda item 13. Okay, then we'll move on then as uh, people are happy enough with the response. Mm -hmm. The Social Security Benefits Operating Order Northern Ireland 2020. Can I refer members to page 425 of the meeting pack? Can I ask members if there are any comments or queries on this, first of all? No? Okay. So are members content that this will be made? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, agenda item 14, SL1, the security, the Social Security Operating Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. And refer me members to page 430 of your meeting pack. Any comments or queries on this? It's the same, yeah. No? Okay. Can I ask members, are you content that this will be made? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Agenda item 15, and now this is where the tongue twisters start. The mesothelioma. No. Meso... Thelioma, Lump Sum Payments, Conditions and Amounts Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. It's at page 434 of your meeting pack. Any comments or queries are not to do with my pronunciation? No? Okay. Are members content that the rule be made? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Oh dear. Next we move on to Jet Item 16, SO1. Right. Remind okay. me. You threatened it out phonetically for me. <laughs> so it's. Okay. New monoconiosis. Yes. The, okay. Etc. Workers' Compensation Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Can I refer members to page 438 of the meeting pack? Or, uh, do members have any comments or queries? And please, please don't ask me to pronounce it again. Yeah, nope. Okay. Can I just <laughs> 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 okay, members. Are members content that this will be made? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Well, I do. I do want to chair. Quite. Mm. It's in, in some detail, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I know I'm, it's to do I'm, with I'm, the lungs. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm jesting a little bit, uh, chair. But maybe uh, maybe Clark could tell me. It indicates there's no consultation in relation to these regulations. They merely increase the rates mm -hmm. under the 1979 uh, scheme. Um, was there a concept? This was legislation applied from Westminster at sit back in '79. It increases incrementally every time it goes through Westminster. It's exactly the same legislation. It's exactly the same amounts uh, that are applied. That's right. Uh, that's it. And that's been in the case since 1979. Well, it's been the case since. Uh, that's what the scheme. Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah. Certainly, since I've been clerk, okay. social event, that's we keep in line with the operating is, is the same. Yeah. We don't deviate. And and, and that, that's a, that's a breathing disorder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the development of breathing disorders and so on. So that's not a catch-all, that's, that's a quite specific... It is specific, yeah. 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 It says the 1979 scheme provides for lump-sum payments to persons with certain dust-related diseases. Yeah. 
Yeah, we've, we've, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's probably a different question, Chairs, related to this mm. specific piece of legislation, but there is a wider matter on the breathing disorders mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that are not dust related exclusively. Okay. okay, thank you. All right, so are, are members content that that rule be made in that case? <coughs> yes. yes. Okay. And then we'll move on to agenda item 18, which is any other business. Do members have any relevant business to committee? Sorry for having to pop out, just consistency stuff. It's okay, you're fine. Okay, members, no relevant or any other business. We'll move on then to item agenda number 19, date, time and location of next meeting. And advise our next meeting will take place here in room 29 in Parliament Buildings next Thursday, 10 a.m., the 12th of March 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.